Right. Well, hello and welcome everybody out in Facebook land. Um, my name is Steve Teresi. I'm the Director of Training and Technical Services here at Gale Audio. I'm located just a little bit north of our main headquarters in Miramar, Florida, it's just a few miles south of me. I have with me Mr. Kevin Ferry, who's up in the greater Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Please say hello, Kevin. What's happening, everybody? Excellent. And in Southern California, we have our producer here for today, Mr. Rob Haynes. So, so Cal, please say hi. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. All right, I'm just going to get this out right now. This one could run long. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we've been excited about talking about some of our more, uh, shall we say, legendary products. And the W6 product line is certainly uh, one of the more legendary products that our company has offered over the years. So um, I, I've promised to try to restrain myself with some of the stories that I, I'll probably share with everyone. Uh, being the old guy of the bunch, I have quite a bit to share. Um, uh, Kevin has sort of created a presentation that allows for me to ramble. Um, so I will take advantage of those opportunities when they present. Um, so speaking of uh, present, um, our presentation for your eyes is slightly delayed. Um, the lag between what we say and when you actually see it is going to be probably around 30 seconds. Rob and I are going to do our best to keep our eye on the chat and make sure that we can answer as many questions as we can. We'll fi fire some of those questions over to Kevin um, as needed. Uh, so please don't hesitate to chime in in that uh, little chat over there. I see a bunch of stuff is already showing up. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, yeah, so hopefully Jeffrey's working on that. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think at this point, we're going to go ahead and ask Kevin to share his screen and kick off our presentation. And uh, Rob, Mr. Producer, you, you got the controls, and I'll, I'll do my best to be quiet. <laughs> All righty. I personally am looking forward to Steve's stories. <laughs> uh, I must be paying you or something. <laughs> All righty, you guys seeing the right screen? We That's are. Great. And no cursors, so you're in good shape. <laughs> I try. There's a there's a guy that keeps reminding me about that. So. <laughs> All righty. So as you guys probably know, or if you don't know already, this uh, session is on the W6 V3 subwoofers, um, which is the current models of them. We are going to talk about the history and get into some different things, um, which gets us into our agenda. Um, the cool stuff to know about the W6 V3 and some of the previous versions of it is actually going to be sprinkled in throughout the entire presentation. I mean, let's face it, these are packed with cool technologies and such a rich history and, and cool stories behind them. Um, these technologies that we're going to talk about are actually extremely beneficial in real, real, uh, real, real world use um, <laughs> the performance and the reliability of the drivers. Let me get my, uh, my talking going on here. <laughs> so um, not only are these the sound quality reference, but they are known for being able to use in compact enclosures also. I'm pretty sure that many of you guys probably use them or know of them for their output too, um, if I'm taking a guess there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take a look at some of the options and uh, and really what the enclosures are and, and some of the different specifications on them now. You have two options, if you want a 10 inch or a 12 inch. So as long as you want one of those two, um, we do have one in the W6 V3 lineup for you. Um, since the specifications between both of the drivers are very, very close to one another, like excursions exactly the same, um, it really comes down to what you have room for in your vehicle and what your application and design of the system is overall too. So what do we mean by small enclosure size? Well, you got about a little over half a cubic foot for a 10 and 0.75 cubic foot uh, sealed is pretty, pretty darn small for a direct number one. <laughs> Just for the record, it is a challenge to build a box small enough to get around this monster speaker and get 0.55 cubic feet. It can be done, of course, but it's not that easy because you do need clearance for the pole vent. So when Kevin's talking about small box, yes, we know you could build a smaller box for some other tenant speakers, but for something of this physical size, it's a challenge and it's really small. So anyway. That's one. Yeah, I mean, your box <laughs> at, at the beginning is going to start off being, a, what, a minimum of probably seven inches, seven and a half inches deep. So <laughs> you're already dealing right, with that exactly. much airspace um, going forward. So like Steve said, when you're dealing with this size, a small enclosure, it's it's tough. It, it is tough. But the nice thing is, is that they fit in those uh, small enclosures and you can tuck them in pretty, pretty well. 
So we're going to start off with some history, and I'm going to give a little quiz time um, for this. Who knows when the W6 was initially released? So version one of the W6. I'm going to wait for answers, and and as I wait for an answer here, I want to get a little off script. (laughs) And I want to talk about when I think about the W6 V3. Um, It really reminds me of the saying, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And there are some really amazing parts and technologies and engineering that has been put into these that make the W6 V3 so special. So when I say that the sum is greater than the parts, it is a huge, huge statement. Um, However, when I think about this, I don't think about it as just a subwoofer. And I'm sure Steve would agree with me. Um, on this too. When I think about the W6 and the history and just how integral of a part they've been to um, to us as a company, it's really greater than one subwoofer or one subwoofer line. And the adoption from the masses made the W6 line more special than I personally could ever imagine, both internally and to the dealers and the public. Yeah, without a doubt, Kevin. So to add to that too. <laughs> Kevin can't see me, but I am sporting my jacket from back in the day. So uh, most people have probably never seen anything quite like this. <laughs> um, but what Kevin is referring to is that the W6, the original version, and some of the answers that we've already gotten in the chat are correct. So good to you guys. We'll cover that in just a second, but. Before the W6s, a lot of the products that we were offering, while very, very solid and innovative in their own right, um, W6 changed all that. It was uh, truly a very different product, not for, just from the weird dual six-ohm coils that Kevin will talk about in a moment and some of the other application-specific things, but just in our design approach and how we actually brought the product to market. And fortunately, it was very successful for us, and everything we've done since the W6 original version it, it really, it all owes itself back to what we did then. Um, the success of the W6 really built the company that all of you know to this day. Um, it, 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 it can't be overstated how important this product was to JL Audio. Um, people tend to you know, point to the W7 or, or our amplifiers or our home audio products or our marine products as you know, the, the really best part about JL Audio. And you know, there is some degree of truth to any one of those comments, but all of them owe their heritage to what we did with the W6s. Without the W6s, we would not be where we are today. Or maybe we would be, it might've just taken a little longer. Um, so yeah, you're right. It is uh, an integral part of who we are as a company, Kevin. This is this is a huge product line, and when we started developing, as Kevin's going to share with us, we've you know, had a, the original version of V2 and then a V3. Um, we don't use the W6 moniker very lightly. You know, we had to weigh: should we call this a W6 or not? And um, because it has this legacy, it has this history and this importance to our company, uh, so we do take the name very seriously. So um, I think you stalled long enough, Kevin, and my story wasn't too long. So I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to take the jacket off. It is warm down here. So. <laughs> I might need to borrow that jacket. <laughs> so probably, or like what Steve said, probably most of us remember was the unique voice coil, 6 ohm, um, to allow them to easily be run in threes. More cone area equals more output. And back then, to get more output, um, really, that was the easiest way to go about um, getting more output. If you think about it, in 1993, I don't know how many thousand plus watt amplifiers were actually available on the market. I mean, that was probably about 20 years before my time, just saying. (laughs) But uh, so there's, there's some interesting points to be made there, Kevin. You know, a lot of people wonder why the dual six ohm, because it just seemed really bizarre. Uh, and they're bringing up the different types of amplifiers that may have been available around then. Uh, back in those days, there was a, a big divide, so to speak, in terms of amplifiers. Uh, the more traditional approach was what was known as a, like a high voltage amplifier. Uh, a lot of the amplifiers that I worked with were high voltage amplifiers. Then there was the other side, which were the high current amplifiers. And those amplifiers, in order to get the power out of them, they had to be loaded down to a lower impedance load. So really, most applications, they needed either a four ohm load or a one ohm load to get maximum performance. Now, as a retailer, you had a choice, like which version would you stock, the four ohm version or the two ohm version? And you could use two drivers to get the various different impedances, blah, 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 blah. So our engineering team led by Lucio came up with this idea that a dual six ohm voice coil, if you use a single speaker, you could wire it to three ohms. Any decent amp that's gonna do four ohms can easily do three ohms, no big deal. A one ohm amp could also drive that, no problem. 
two drivers, you could start seeing how the, the math can kind of work out. You can drive two drivers at a six ohm load or at a one and a half ohm load. And again, those two amplifier types could handle both of those. But if you use three of them with a dual six ohm coil, you could get a four ohm mono load with three drivers or a four ohm mono load, uh, sorry, a one ohm mono load with those same three drivers, just depending on how you wired it. So the real question became, what's so magical about three? Well, if you think about the shock towers between, you know, in a sedan, you open up the back and you got the shock towers, the distance between the shock towers is, you know, 32 to 35 inches in most cases. So if you wanted to put a couple of 10s back there, it's no problem. A couple of 12s, yeah, you could do that. A pair of 15 is going to be a challenge. And I know that how the math works, but you have the frame of the speaker too. But if you did three tens, three tens would fit perfectly in there, but you could never wire it to get a decent impedance load. That's where the dual six ohm really came in handy. With a one ohm amp or a four ohm amp, you could get three tens that fit perfectly in there and slammed all day long. And Kevin's right, thousand watt amplifiers back then didn't really have them. There was some for sure, but the vast majority of them were between five and 750 watts. Yeah. And on three drivers, all day long. It was a beautiful thing. And in some ways, I wish we would go back to that. But that's a that's a different conversation. So that's kind of why the dual six home was really special. And it was an approach that, from an engineering point of view, it had some advantages and obviously some challenges. But from an application point of view, which you anyone that's watching any of my trainings, you know that I really focus on JL Audio as an application-based product. There's lots of different products out there, but we focus on the application. And the W6 was a really great example of that when we first launched it. So just keep that in mind as you see the history unfold. There we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and think about it, doubling your power back then, if you already have a 500-watt amplifier, it's it's nearly impossible, or a 750-watt amplifier, it was nearly impossible to get that much more power out of it. Um, but I personally still preach adding drivers Yep. Thank you. <laughs> still a better way, right? But anyway, <laughs> I mean, you can definitely get loud. I remember one of my my first experiences when I after I got into the car audio industry in 2004. Um, you know, I didn't know really anything. I mean, I really jumped in the deep end, being a 21 year old restaurant server to owning and running a car stereo shop overnight, pretty much. So I remember, you know, coming in and seeing the big V2 W6s on the display boards of our shop. But, you know, I remember uh, one of my customers who actually became a good friend and my roommate, he had a S10, you know, uh, extended cab, low rider truck and three uh, 12 W6 V1s on, you know, a 400 watt two channel Audison amp, like the old ones that had the wood grain the wood, yeah, uh, I from the 90s. And my goodness on, you know, that little amount of power compared to what we would think of nowadays that you have to have for a subwoofer. <laughs> exactly. I could hear him like two blocks down busy Harbor Boulevard in Costa Mesa, California, which is a very noisy area. So, you know, we, we always joke there's no replacement for displacement, but, you know, adding that extra cone area and a long excursion type driver, you can make a loud system without needing a lot of power. And that's definitely, as Steve said, going to improve the reliability of the, the product as well. But that was for me, that was just such an awesome system to hear. Um, you know, on a s relatively smaller amp, and you could hear him all the way down the road. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And then a, just a quick touch point, in 1997, we actually came out with a Chrome version of the W6. So that was just, awesome. <laughs> just a quick little touch point on there. But going back to the uh, to 93, with the original release of the W6, the Mini emerged. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another, uh, another photo of it here. So... Um, that's awesome. That's Gary Morton, by the way, driving that little mini there. Um, Gary's actually uh, an installer unlike any other that I've ever met, and I doubt most of our audience would, would even, you know, maybe even know who Gary is. But he is uh, he's impeccable. He he gets the detail. He gets all of it. He understands integrity in terms of you know uh, both electrical and mechanical stuff in terms of trim panel and all that kind of work. And he he literally worked side by side with Lucio in designing and building this original car. Um, there was another you know a big team around them that all contributed to it. But Gary is the lead installer, and you know it kind of became his car. 
um, you know, he, it was his little baby. So that's really cool to see a picture of him sitting in that car. Um, and, you know, I got to share, sorry, <laughs> I got to share this story with our audience. Um, when Kevin was putting together the training, we were kind of talking about the Mini. And, you know, of course, the Mini is very unique. It's a very different kind of car. You don't see this type of Mini. Now, a lot of a lot of you watching are young enough to not even know that there was an original Mini back in the 60s, right? <laughs> what this is, right? You know, the one that you see now is a kind of a throwback, a kind of a homage, so to speak, to what was um, you know what we had used. And uh, people wondered where we even came up with the idea to use a Mini. Well, there's a couple of things about it. One, of course, it's a unique car, kind of different, something that you know a lot of people hadn't seen. But the reality of it is, back at that time, although our company was very successful, we didn't have tons of money to spend on booth space for trade shows. So we needed a car that we could do a proper demonstration with that would actually fit in a small booth. So the Mini was actually perfect for that. <laughs> and especially, you know, when you have some, some knowledge and understanding about how that interior could be reworked. And that's where Lucio and his engineering team came in and came up with some really cool ideas of how to get great performance. Um, the car was rock solid. It, it was shocking when you, you know, were in, a, in a, um, an exhibition hall and the car was there on the show floor and there were people inside doing the demonstration. They'd be listening to this car at what would otherwise be just ear splitting levels. And on the outside, you could have a normal conversation as if there was no big deal. Sure, you could tell something was going on, certainly by the smiles on people's faces, but the car itself did not um, release energy to the outside world uh, like so many cars uh, do. Now, a lot of our customers would be like, well, where's the fun in that? <laughs> but remember, ours was about demonstrating our product for, for people on the inside so that we could have conversation on the outside. The amount of sound deadening and reinforcement that we did on this vehicle was unbelievable. It was rock solid. That back end that we're looking at now, you can see the, the trio of woofers. Um, those are old precision power art series amplifiers that are in the back. And if you look at the little boxes, I know the image is a little small, but those are passive uh, crossover networks for the JL Audio component speakers. Yes, back in 1993, and actually even before that, JL Audio had component speakers. The 5CS1 and the 5CS3 were very popular, and uh, 5CS3 is what we used uh, for this particular version of the Mini, which had these neat little silk dome tweeters and um, kind of a dual speaker array with the tweeters in the middle. And it sounded fantastic. Uh, and, you know, make, uh, I make no apologies for using the product that we did because it absolutely hammered, sounded crystal clear, and delivered exactly what we were looking for. Uh, the other thing that we talked about when uh, we were getting ready for the training was that when you look at some of the systems that you see in the marketplace today uh, that are very common, some of the system designs are very elaborate. There's lots of things going on. This one was dead simple. We had a 600 watt amp run mono to three subwoofers. So one amp, three subs. And we had a four channel amp powering up the left and right speakers. That's it. That was it. We had a source unit. We had a parametric EQ, a PAR225 from Precision Power that was up in the dash. That's where we controlled volume and made on the fly adjustments. And then we had an electronic crossover and the two amplifiers. It's about as simple as it gets. And uh, Kevin is actually a strong advocate of, um, we want to do a training or a conversation about a proper system design and i'm going to give you a hint what that car was was a proper system design <laughs> yeah, proper and, uh, system design and an amazing install and absolutely that's where, yeah, that's where the magic comes in take a simple idea and execute it to the highest level so um this car definitely did that yeah. uh -oh. and as josh collins mentions the famous iso plates yeah so we had uh, <laughs> uh, the tri-plate which is uh, a version that you see here, and the tri-oval, which was a triangular-shaped um, version of that. Uh, and th those are interesting. And a lot of people say, well, what did you ever do with them? Well, th again, this is going so long. I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> but right. the problem that we run into is that due to the shape of those, those plates, the, the speakers were set back, and there was a displacement value um, associated with the, the panel itself. So the 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 fiberglass panel would displace some air volume from inside the enclosure. And it, uh, uh, furthermore, it pushed the woofers down into the enclosure further as well. So now the speakers sit down further. They don't displace anymore, but they're inside the enclosure more so than they would have been. So what happened was the woofers started needing smaller volumes and they got deeper. Yeah. So using this plate that forced you into two dimensions and made the third dimension it was so deep that it was very challenging to make a box that would hold the woofers using the plate and had the box volume be small enough. So that's what we were talking about, the 0.55 cubic feet for the 10. If we tried to use a plate like that, you couldn't build a wooden enclosure 
Well, some of you guys might be able to, but you can easily build a wooden enclosure to accommodate the correct amount of airspace and use those plates. So they became less valuable. Um, so yeah, that's what happened to the plates. <laughs> and Glenn's putting a comment in the chat there that he used to make his own. That's the other thing that became more common that shops yeah. were able to create their own. Um, and I think that's going to come up again later in our conversation on the W sixes. So I'll stop talking about it for now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, this is one I wanted to skip into. Um, Antonio sent this one in. It's another trio of original W sixes. Super install or super cool install. Looks like a 03 ish GM SUV, whether it's a Suburban or a Denali XL or or what have you, um, or even an Escalade. Uh, ESV or whatever, but uh, super cool install. And I bet you that thing really gets on it. Uh, really, really gets on it, I'm sure. So now that we kind of hit on the uh, V1 in here, does anyone know when V2 came to market would be my next question. And, and kind of as we have another minute to talk, I'm going to just bring up the... Uh, the versions and it, it's tough to think about how such an amazing subwoofer could get better and the efforts and efforts that our engineering team consistently came up with um, to have new ways to improve on the W6 with each version is, is just an amazing uh, thought on itself too. Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, Kevin, that the W6 to use that name, um, it had to be special and the time frame between the original launch and the version two that some of the answers are coming in and we got some correct ones. Um, but, but when we were developing the new version, it, you know, we wanted to make sure that it checked a lot of the boxes for the, the, the to properly convey the history of what the W6 was. Um, obviously some things change because as uh, you did so, so well pointing out about the amplifiers, thousand watt amplifiers, when the W6 V2 became available were far more common than they were when the original version did. And a lot of the, um, the concern about uh, addressing the various different amplifier types that was very prevalent in the early 1990s were far less prevalent when the version two became available. So some of the, uh, some of the things associated with the original version, we were able to let go, but when it came to performance, we absolutely had to take it to the next level. Um, and I think personally, I think the V2 definitely held up the W6 uh, legacy quite well. And I think it brought it to a, an even higher plateau. So you've already got the, the answer up there. And I think Tyler was the first one to put it out there. Rob, you can confirm that for me. Um, but you know, he put it back before he, Kevin even asked the question. So. <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch of answers for 2002. Yeah, so, yeah, that's good. So it's nice that you guys remember that. That was um, a pretty incredible time. Uh, just as a, a brief aside, the, the W6 version two, um, you know, Kevin actually made the comment in our conversations leading up to today that uh, we almost felt bad for it in a way because it was very much in the shadow of some of the other things that we were coming out with. But there was a, a large group of people that really gravitated towards it. And I think Kevin's made a mention that the W6 is kind of the, like the reference for sound quality. And I tend to agree with him on that because so many people knew that the W6 meant high quality. Um, but as a little aside, and I'm looking at you, Glenn, because I know you've been a long time uh, follower of ours, but our W7 came out and just about a year later is when the W6 V2 came out. Uh, I don't think that's ever happened before or since where we came out with two premium products back to back within a year. Now, there's a lot of people that are laughing, including Glenn right now, that we introduced the W7 about four years before we actually shipped it. So that maybe it doesn't count. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to share that uh, because the heritage between a six and a seven are very tightly linked, um, as is true with most of the products, but they're no more obvious than in that um, application there, where the sevens launched and then the sixes were right on the heels. And you could definitely see that they're cut from the same genetic cloth, 100%. Um, as a brief aside on that, brief, I promise, uh, the W6 is uh, the ad that we, sorry, the W7s when we launched them, the ad said tight across the top. And that was it. Just a picture of the wolf that said tight. When we came out with the W6 V2, v, uh, the very next year, we put tight genes, G-E-N-E-S. In other words, genetics, the tight genetics reference back to the W7s. Um, just for the, the end of the aside here, that didn't work in international markets because the the play on words like tight jeans, like jeans you wear and jeans genetic, it didn't work. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I think in Germany, they changed it to we are family. 
And the church doesn't have the same ring. <laughs> anyway, continue on, Kevin. Sorry about that. <laughs> and that was, you know, that V2 came in right when you got into retail there, Rob. That was right in that same yep. time frame. That was a good, uh, good position for you guys there. Um, so with the W6 V2, the Mini also got a V2 in the 2002 time frame. Sure yes, did. this is the same Mini. If you take a look at it, it's almost hard to believe. Even uh, this outside picture, it looks completely different with a different body kit on it. It's got the little hood on there, the front end, some uh, some deep dish wheels. And just remember, this is the two early 2000 time frame. So when, so when we take a look at the system here, it is crazy to think that this was this was done in the early 2000s. You know, Steve was talking about Gary and, and how good of a of, of vision and an installer he is. And when we take a look at this and what he and his team have done, the system design and the mirror, uh, material selections and the, the way it's all laid out, this could pass for something that was actually built now. I yeah. mean, you take a look at the aluminum and, and the vinyl and, and all of that. Um, and, and when we think about early 2000s, you probably have a lot of painted, loud fiberglass mm -hmm. enclosures and all of that, where this is, like I said, it's it's very refined. It's very something that you would probably see built in, in today's time frame. And they just did an amazing job revamping that system. Before and you the slide, as, as you might expect, I have stories on this car, right? <laughs> so... Um, Obviously, the outside looks very, very different than version one, but it is the same car. The, the, the core elements are all still there. Obviously, we wanted to freshen it up and have a new look for the version two, you know, make everything kind of look fresh and different. And uh, Gary was definitely in on this. And uh, Bill Hamsey was one of the lead installers. And, you know, he really focused on minimizing the use of materials and the amount of flash and just do a really, you know, critical job of making sure everything looks really sharp. And as uh, Kevin's already mentioned, a lot of what we see now has that same level of detail and, and focus, which is really great. It shows that our industry is, is doing a really kick-ass job. So that's, that's really nice to see. Um, but we actually did a little video that kind of introduced the car. And there was a woman that was at the trade show that had no interest in audio. It was just kind of walking through a CES. So there was no interest in audio, just kind of walking through the hall. And she saw the car and she said, oh, my goodness, what year is this? And, you know, Gary was talking to her and she says, you know, this doesn't look like it's factory. What did you change? <laughs> like, if you look at this car, everything is different. It's completely different. And what you don't see in the images, and Kevin, if you don't mind going back one slide, um, you'll notice that the hood has, uh, or the bonnet, sorry, for the UK guys, and that's appropriate in this case, that the, uh, the bonnet there is raised up and it looks like it's bulky. And the reason for that is the full size flat panel screen in there. And we did a 5.1 system with a processor. So in the next picture, you'll see that there is uh, rear speakers, which is very uncommon in a lot of our vehicles. And that's because we did have a surround sound system. So Gary's comment back to her, well, we changed the paint, you know, we put a body kit on it and we upgraded the TV from black and white to color. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, wow, really? <laughs> but it was, it was really great. Um, you know, there's some elements of the original design that are very subtle in this install as well. The original design of the Mini had a, a variable volume enclosure that switched between sealed and ported. So we could throw a, a, a switch and there was a flapper valve that would um, open to a larger chamber that had a port and it was closed. It was a sealed box. You flip the switch, it would open. It'd be the larger volume, which is necessary for a proper ported box with the port already in it. So it would open up into that larger chamber. So when we really wanted to shake your teeth, we would open it up, put the ported box on, and really just have some fun. When we did this version, Bill was able to execute um, a variant on that that kind of moved the plate from one side to the other that would allow the same type of behavior. So this also had the sealed and ported enclosure with the switch. So it was kind of neat to see that we kept all of that. Um, so yeah, it was good, good stuff. And yeah, just the use of aluminum and everything in there, just a great, uh, great install. So while we're talking about the car real quick, I can only ignore it for so long in the chat. But many people are asking, where is the car? Where is the car now? I'm not even sure. Um, I, I will say the car did get cursed. 
Uh, and it definitely <laughs> got cursed between the version one and the version two. We had so many problems with the car, not uh, audio wise. Audio was rock solid, no problems at all there. The problems were with that freaking uh, body kit that Gary would call the magic kit that we got from someone in the UK. And we called it the magic kit because getting it to fit took an act of magic. It, it always had problems and it got damaged everywhere we brought it. And I see John Griggs is watching and John Griggs knows all too well the kind of problems that we had when we did send the mini home for uh, some trade events that we did over in the UK with it back, you know, whenever that was. So the car was cursed. So wherever it is, I feel bad for whoever's got it. So Rob, do you know? Yeah, so I remember when I started in 2014 with JL Audio, it was in the rafters. Yeah. The it was on a shelf. They, We ended up selling it. They took it off the forklift. Rats or something ate all the wiring in the car. So they completely, in R&D, they completely rewired the car, all of the electrical, all new speaker wires, power wires. for the, They pretty much got it back to new. And then it was sold to a collector, I think. Okay. But I think it's at extreme performance or avant-garde design in Palm Beach or Palm City. Oh, and wow. I, it's out here. I mm-hmm. think they're the ones that bought it and it's in their car collection of uh, cool cars that they have. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. I, I didn't know where it went. We, I remember it was up in the rafters, so to speak. And I remember the issues that we had with some... Uh, Creatures enjoying themselves in there a little bit too much. So. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it's in Palm Beach with uh, Jeremy Carlson and the guys at uh, Avant Garde and uh, Extreme. Very cool. Nice. All right. Sorry, Kevin. Back on it, man. Sorry. That's all right, man. We're only on like. Uh... <laughs> so after V2, can anyone guess when V3 came along? And we're getting easier as we're going along here. So. We'll see if uh, see if anybody can hop in on there. I am glad to hear that it did get uh, get fixed up and, okay. and is back in working order and, and in yeah, some of these collection. Uh, that's pretty cool. That, uh, it's very hard for us to let go of these history items like that. Right? So, um, that must have taken a lot for for the powers that be to say, yeah, okay, we'll we'll go ahead and let it go. Um, the, but the truth was, that because of the cursed nature of it, we were afraid to bring it out of the rafters. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, it had a forklift incident, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm surprised did. that uh, yeah. they put it up that high, right? Yeah. So we do have answers coming in for V3, Kevin. We have 2008, 2013, 2015. 2012 is actually when it was uh, when it was released there. So um, the V3 came out in 2012, and that is our current model that we have now. And when we take a look at the differences between uh, V2 and V3, um, we came out with more excursion and higher power handling. And we'll actually get into some of those details here in a second. But I do want to show this Jeep from Ultimate Audio. It houses four of the W6 V3s and what uh, I would call a down firing enclosure. It's, uh, it's <laughs> technically high, accurate. So it's not your traditional <laughs> down firing that's close, um, but it is technically down firing. It is technically down firing. <laughs> And this was in the back of a, a Jeep. Pretty cool install from those guys. So, what's cool about that install, though, if you think about it, to have that's not a relatively large enclosure, and to be able to suspend four looks like ten inch woofers, gotta be tens across the roof yeah. line of a of a Jeep. You couldn't do that with other woofers. Those small enclosure requirements of the W six V threes really are what make that installation right there happen. Yeah, you maybe could get four tens up there, but nothing in the power handling range of what a W6 V3 right. uh, can handle. That's a lot of weight hanging down. There's a lot of weight hanging there, without a doubt. Still a down firing, and now they, uh, you know, something, <laughs> something less than that. You know? Anyway, so. So as good as the W6 V2 was, and it was amazing for 10 years um, that uh, the V2 ran for. Um, but as time goes on, again, our engineering team is always evolving, coming up with some new cool ideas and technologies, and we're able to squeak even more performance out of it with V3. Um, this is a good comparison showing um, some of the technologies between uh, V3 and the V2. We're able to get, or we were able to get more um, X Max out of it. It's got a larger motor structure on it. Um, I believe it went from about 0.6 um, on the uh, 
on the throw of that driver to 0.75. Um, so it was quite a bit more um, movement on the driver that we were yeah. able to get out of it. And just about everything was brand new with the V3, um, including the surround cone, its attachment method, um, spider, um, the cooling system on it. So it was a large revamp. And again, it goes back to Steve saying it's got to be amazing to have that W6 nomenclature on it. Yeah. They really did uh, bring it out with this piece. So how did it all start and how did we get here? Well, it starts out with Lucio and his team of engineers. Um, he has surrounded himself with an engineering team that is the best in the business. And I'm sure everybody wants to say that. Um, but when you take a look at the products that we have come out with over the years, um, they really speak largely on their own for that and, and what we have done as a company. Our engineering team is second um, in size only to our production team, um, which is quite amazing uh, on its own. So when we take a look at our engineering team, it's actually larger than our sales, training, marketing department, all of them, tech support, all of them put together don't equal the size of our engineering team. So we do put a lot of uh, a lot of man hours in on that side of things. And again, the products really speak for that um, and, and really show up those uh, those efforts. Before you jump on, I just want to share something that, um, you know, kind of one of the more legacy stories that I have on the W6s. When I first started uh, working with uh, the JL Audio family, I worked at a retail store and my, um, you know, uh, the, the store that I worked for was actually owned by the same people that own JL Audio. So on Wednesday, my day off, I would drive down to JL Audio and I would uh, spend time talking with Lucio, trying to learn as much as I could about driver design and you know, audio and things of that nature. So that was that was my education. I would go down there and learn. And I recall one day going in to see Lucio and he was in you know the small little closet of a room where he did a lot of the listening tests. And he had these three unmarked woofers in a box with a little switch that he was switching between them. And I go in and I'm like really loud. I'm like, hey, Lou, how are you? Like, Shh. Okay. So he starts playing some tracks and he switches between the three drivers. And I promise this is going somewhere. He switches between the three drivers and, you know, he's playing some music. And he turns the volume down and he says, which one did you prefer? I said, oh, I, I don't know. Go ahead and play it again. You know, so let's, let's listen to that again. So he starts playing the track and he's switching between them. And I, I could lie to you and tell you I heard these differences, but I, I don't. I doubt that I did. Now, remember, this is going back many, many years ago before the W6 original version even shipped. What Lou was actually listening to is differences between three different spider elements, the lower suspension of the driver, not the one that you see on, around the, uh, the front of the speaker, but behind the speaker. He had three different versions of a spider that he was evaluating to determine which one would eventually go into production on this yet to be launched W6 product. So I think that must have been 1991 that that, um, that actually happened. So it took more than a year for him to finally sign off on that uh, as the, the part that was gonna go into production. Um, and the reason why I bring it up here and I didn't bring it up earlier is because what you saw on the desk there where KK and Lou were looking at, uh, the modeling that they're doing on the screen and underneath Lou's right arm there, you'll see that they're using what's known as FEA analysis, um, finite element analysis procedure. Basically what this does is it takes some of that try it uh, approach and quantifies it. Uh, finite element analysis takes a complex thing such as spider design where there's lots of things that can change and breaks it into a finite number of different elements that you can then analyze. And what W6 did for us in that little room that day that Lucio was doing a listening test on the spider differences, we now do in a virtual world where we can analyze all of that behavior in a more dynamic sense and get better product faster than ever before. But all that stuff we didn't have the money for. A lot of it didn't exist back then either, for that right. matter. But W6 built the backbone by which everything else is now being done. That image, the, the software that they're using, what Lou used to do was iterative, where he you know, build it and try it, build it and try it, build it and try it. Everything about our new design has really come down to we have these finite element analysis routines that will test to get very, very close to what we want. And then we wind up with a smaller number of iterations to bring a better product to market. And again, all of this is part of the legacy of W6, and this image kind of screams to that. And what Kevin's going to share with you now is probably the most exciting thing that the original W6 did for us. Kevin, take it away. Actually, I'm going to interrupt Kevin real quick. I, because since Steve was talking about Lucio, a question did come up in the chat from Elias asking if Lou 
is still part of our day-to-day -day operations, and he is. Uh, Muccio is our CEO. Um, he's still our chief, uh, you know, loudspeaker engineer. And um, him and his team of, I think it's like upwards of 20 now, a very, very talented uh, loudspeaker engineers work as a group to uh, design all of our uh, current products and, uh, you know, whatever lies in the future. So we're very blessed that he's still uh, involved. Um, you know, he did bring aboard Andy Oxenhorn in the late 90s to be the president of JL Audio. Uh, Lou's a really intelligent man. He can definitely run the business, but he his passion is for designing <laughs> cool stuff. So, you know, we brought Andy aboard um, back in the day to run the company, oversee the sales team and the, the, the you know, the real day to day operations of the business. So Lou could do what his passion is, and that's just design and build kick ass stuff. And the key point there, you know, to, to summarize what Rob just said, the answer lies is absolutely yes. Lucio is an intricate part of our business. And um, as Rob was just sharing, he's smart enough to know when he needs help. He brought Andy in many, many years ago, and Andy took us to a whole new level, allowing Lucio to focus on his true passion, which, as Rob just said, is designing and building premium quality audio uh, audio gear. Um, and Andy took care of everything else, basically. So Lou, you go do that. Andy's going to take care of the rest. And then Lou built this huge team of engineering effort that Rob and uh, Kevin have already alluded to. And that's really where, where we are today. Um, so I, I see a new comment in there. What do they got? That's there? A cool story from Craig saying a customer noticed a large amount of JL product in his shop. And the customer stated that Lucio built him his first set of speakers oh, when he was 16. His dad was in the warehouse space next to JL Audio back in the day. And for his birthday, Lucio brought them over to him, the speakers he built him. So wow. that's what that, Lou is, dude. It's like, imagine if he still had those. Right? I know. <laughs> so, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Please tell us about um, you know, what you got on the screen there. So, <laughs> you know, we talked about our engineering effort and, and Steve alluded at uh, a few minutes ago about what the W6 V1 brought to us or the original W6 brought to us. And it was the ability to grow um, and, and having that growth. <clears throat> so that way we could have these large woofer production line like the one that you guys see up here now we've got many many production lines but i'm going to kind of stay on track um, with the uh with the large woofer production line as you guys see here um, all of our production lines have a great great mix of hand and machine touches and we're going to kind of walk through some of the different uh, areas or areas um, in those uh, assembly lines so the motor assemblies are done on another actually really recently conceived line um, that had come out um, probably about less than a year ago i think uh, maybe just about a year uh, coming up here. Um, the motor assemblies, once they go through that uh, line and they are assembled, then they're actually stored until they're needed. And once the build order comes in for a W6 V3, the motors are pulled from stock and then mated with the baskets like you see here um, in this image. The torque wrenches on the line, they're all checked regularly to make sure that they are in spec or yeah, that they are in spec. Multiple um, times one a day. Thing you notice, I mean, you got a lot going on on here, but one of the cool things that I've noticed about this picture personally is actually the arm that the torque wrench is on. Um, so that way you're not lifting it up and, and doing things because it is going to be repetitive. You're spinning the subwoofer around and screwing it into motor uh, assemblies or you know, screwing that basket into motor assemblies as you're going through. So as you're doing that, you're not having to lift a torque wrench all day long. And it's little things like that that really, really add up with what we've done with these lines over the years and, and just making things better. So not everything is done by hand. We do use some automation for some of the adhesives. Not all of them, but some. Here you can see the subwoofer assembly inside an enclosed uh, plexi box. Once the assembly is inside, there's actually doors on the sides that close down. The adhesive or drying agent for the adhesive or both um, is sprayed on. Then the doors will open up and the driver will move on to the next station and the next driver will move on and the process repeats with that automation. 
Now, not every glue up process is done by automation. Here we're laying some adhesive on the backside of the dust cap. And then once that adhesive is applied, the dust cap's actually lined up and joined with the main subwoofer assembly by hand there. You can see we got some tooling on there just to make sure everything lines up and looks, uh, looks good. Once the driver is complete, it actually heads down the line into a booth for QA testing. And here we can see the driver being run through the testing process. And this is pretty cool. And, and this is really the first time we've got this in depth on, on some of the line things on there. And when they are doing the testing here, that is a touch screen up there in the right hand or up our, on his right hand corner there. And he can pass or fail it on the touch screen. Um, after it passes, we'll actually go down into the shipping uh, area where it's packaged up, given a serial number, all of that good stuff. And then unless it is being mated with an enclosure, um, they are sent out at that point in time. Um, now, if it is being mated with an enclosure, then it will go over to that assembly area. It'll be installed in the enclosure. And then we'll actually go through and test it one more time to make sure that the sub is working properly with the, uh, with the enclosure itself and there's no noises, rattlings, or anything like that. This here is a super cool uh, photo we're talking about. Very cool photo. We're going through things. This is actually the first W6 Six, three, uh, V3 production run off of the line here that they're holding up um, and showing. So this is a very, very cool picture. And it is, like we said, uh, one of the first W6 V3s off the production yeah. line. The guy who took the picture is uh, Dwayne Spanbrook. He's our VP of uh, loudspeaker engineering. Um, so him and I went out there to, to see the birth of it. Um, I've been working with Dwayne since 1990 or so uh, so it's uh it was really great because he you know being the vp of, of loudspeaker engineering um you know he's lucho's right hand when it comes to this stuff and has been for many many years working together with the larger team so it was really like kevin said it's a very special picture that you know to bring back really good memories you know watching when that thing came off and that, yeah. i'm looking at the pictures and our, our crew look great you know most of Actually, every single person in those pictures, I believe, still is working with us. Right. So, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's great to see. You know, seeing the the old style facility, so to speak, um, knowing that we've made improvements since then. Uh, but yeah, it's a great picture. Thank you for putting that in there. I really appreciate that one. <laughs> Now, after the W6 V3s get shipped out, they find their way um, in homes and really cool enclosures like this one by uh, Kevin Albr Albright at, uh, at Car Toys. Put a lot of detail into this enclosure and did a really, really nice job with it. Um, so nice work. I'm sure that uh, W6 V3 is very happy in that uh, that space and, uh, and the customer is happy with the, uh, the work and the output on it too. So we're going to step into some of the technologies and design of the W6 V3. We're going to kind of skip through this guy pretty quick um, and, and just kind of do some real touch points on there. Um, you have a stationary magnet. You have a voice coil. The AC voltage goes through the, uh, the voice coil on there. There's the frame that kind of holds everything together and makes sure that, uh, that everything that should be stationary is stationary on there. And then you have your suspension that moves up and down. And then your cone that should also be uh, moving up and down on there. And that's what compresses and rarefies the air molecules to create the sound um, through there. So with the W6 V3, it does that a lot. It has a lot of movement on there and there's a lot of things that are going on with that driver. So we're gonna get in and talk about a few of the technologies that make this such a, a, a high performance yet still very, very reliable um, subwoofer. Uh, Steve touched on this and, and really gave a great description of our DMA, our DMA, and that's really what our finite uh, element analysis is. It goes through and we're able to look at all of the parts of the motor, see how they're going to kind of work together and really minimize the listening of three different subwoofers with a spider on there. That I would honestly have to say I'm with Steve. I probably, I, I don't have Lucio's ears by any means. I could 
probably not hear the difference between those three unless it was absolutely major on there. But this is a really important deal for us because all of our speakers from the W7 on up, we use this program to go through and take the motor and assembly and really see how all of those parts are going to work um, with one another. And one of the other things that's very, very special with the DMA is it takes a look at all of those parts and how they're going to work together, not only stationary, but mm -hmm. also while the driver is in motion too, which is different than most everything else out there um, that, that people are doing. So it's very, very important. And that's one of the things that's that, that we take pride on because a subwoofer is going to be in motion. Something could look on great on paper stationary, but when you start playing it, it might run into some issues where we have this, we're able to look at everything while it's in motion and we're able to make sure that the customer is going to be happy with the performance of their driver. I now, think that's a really critical point that Kevin just brought up. You know, we, we get, we, I'll, I'll use me, I get really geeked out on some of the technologies that we put into our products. Um, and when it comes to subwoofers, uh, there, there's some really cool stuff that we've done for geeks, right? For, for people like me that get really into this stuff. But something that's really important and what Kevin just touched on, I want to emphasize is these technologies are not just ideas that we come up with that we think might be cool. They're actually intended to make it better for our users, people that are actually using the product in real world applications. Everything that Kevin's going to review, including this DMA that he just touched on, has been developed as a way of that we can make a better product in some way, be that in terms of overall performance, higher excursion capability, better reliability, you know, uh, better tolerances, whatever, whatever the case may be, that's, that's what we're analyzing. And, Every single thing that he's going to talk about, with very rare exceptions, is all coming from the mindset of how can we make this a better experience for our customers. We truly care about this stuff. And even though it's all techy, geeky, kind of crazy stuff that goes on on the inside, that's why they're engineers. That's what they work on. We identify problems, we identify areas of concern, and we address them. So there, I saw some comments in the chat, and I'm pretty sure Rob is flagging them for a com uh, conversation a little bit later about the different types of materials that we use and you know the different type of venting that's being done. All of this, every single one of those things, none of these choices are made lightly. They're all done for a performance benefit in some way, shape, or form. And again, so just deal with some of the techie weird stuff because all of it is there for you, really. It, it genuinely is. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's it's all there for performance and reliability. So that way the expectations, if you're a dealer, your customer's happy. If you're the customer, then you're happy because you have that performance and reliability all in one driver there. So like we said, it does cut down the amount of time um, on building these drivers, like Steve said. However, you we do want to build them. We want to listen to them. We want to make any changes that we need to make. Um, it's not going to be perfect just because it is perfect on paper. There might be some things that come on um, as as the all of the parts are assembled on there. So we can take a look at that, listen to them if we need to make some changes, which more than likely if it's a first version or, or second version or third version, we're gonna make some changes on there and then go ahead and build another one. Um, but it does cut the design time down dramatically and gives us an amazing start um, off the bat with the, uh, the DMA and that FEA analysis. So PVAC or pull vent airflow control, um, it made it, it's made its way into the V3 and is one of the key parts of why the power handling was actually increased when we went to V3. Um, this bullet shaped structure is inside the pull vent itself and it directs the airflow and increases the velocity and it reduces the temperature of the voice coil by getting cool air in there fast and directing it into a point that is very, very important directly onto that uh, voice coil. Um, there's a wise group of people that teach how uh, too much power over time is one of the main mechanical causes of subwoofer failure. Um, and this is because the driver cannot dissipate that heat that is being generated inside. Um, so knowing the use and application of the W6V3, we've put a ton of work and technology into cycling this fresh air in and out of the voice coil uh, area quickly. So that way it's going to limit 
those mechanical failures um, in there. So we Thermal really, failure. again, like Steve said, these things Thermal aren't failure. just put in there to put them in there so that we have a story to tell. These are real life use technologies that are put into these subwoofers that are going to help benefit, extend the life of the driver and make sure that you guys are being able to use them and get the full use out of them. In a consistent Josh, like, look a bit. <laughs> What's that? Josh Collins puts that uh, it's his favorite aspect of the driver that the, the rear vent is really cool to look at through like an acrylic window on the back of the enclosure. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. I remember when they um, they started showing us how this this technology would work, and um, I, I think Glenn was referring to the Venturi effect, which basically yeah. uh, what what's being referred to here is there's a way to to cool off air by compressing it and doing some interesting things with the way it flows through. There's a delicate uh, balance between making something that causes a chuffing noise and making something that does the cooling effect. And as Kevin did such a really good job pointing out that this is all intended because we know that you guys are gonna hit this thing with a ton of power to try to get performance out of it. We have to do something with the heat that's caused by that ton of power. So earlier we were kind of talking around um, about having more than one speaker, but most of you don't wanna do that. You wanna put as much power as you possibly can into a single speaker. So we gotta find a way to keep that thing cool for you. There are some other performance advantages for keeping a voice coil cool, but the biggest issue is those thermal problems or uh, potentially glue breakdown issues as a result of excessive heat. And again, these technologies, while boring on paper, mean so much when it comes to the performance of the driver. That's a good shot that you got right and there. This, yeah, I was just going to say, this is a great, great picture. It's a better picture. I wanted to show what it looked like from the back because that's, you know, what people mostly see it. But this cutaway shot really gives you an overall picture of how the air would come into the pole piece and be compressed and then speed up across the uh, the inside of the voice coil area. And you may have seen similar ideas of controlling airflow. I know Glenn, or you guys said that Glenn brought something up on there. Um, even in recent years, which is crazy to me, you know, we've come up with this technology many, many, many years ago. But in recent years, I've seen more like air filters for cars and stuff like that, trying to incorporate a, a similar type of uh, design on there, just to speed up air and uh, and get fresh air in a lot faster. So hey, it's pretty cool. It is pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> yeah, move on, go. To work alongside uh, the PVAC, there's actually a channel, and this is the elevated uh, frame cooling technology. There's a channel between the top plate and the frame, and this allows cool air to come directly in at a perfect spot on the voice coil also on the outside. And these technologies really work together with one another to keep the driver's internals uh, cool and help raise that power handling again and sound quality as well. Um, when internals of a speaker get really, really hot, um, sometimes a, a lesser subwoofer, your parameters might start ship, uh, shifting and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So keeping that driver cool is very, very important, not just for reliability, but also for the sound quality aspect of it too. And, uh, and again, these two things work really well with one another. And this picture, even though the uh, the title is the floating cone attachment method or FCAM. I want to start off by showing you, um, before I get into it, I want to start off by showing you the elevated cooling frame and the PVAC and how these two technologies work together um, really side by side um, to get fresh air into that voice coil on both sides and get that hot air out at the same time. So um, when we take a look at the voice coil, the PVAC helps the inside of the voice coil get cooled down, and then your elevated frame uh, cooling helps get the outside of the voice coil down. So they really do work in conjunction with one another. Keep that uh, voice coil and internals of the subwoofer as cool as possible, which again are going to help with the reliability and your performance um, of your W6V3. Speaking of hot air, let me let me spout some more. Uh <laughs> Um, the, the the concept of what led to the the, the PVAC, um, many of us are probably familiar with the idea of a vented pole piece. Now, if you think about the, the, the design of the speaker, you can look at it in this image and forget about the PVAC for a second. Without the PVAC, a vented pole piece would be exactly what you see there, a large opening in the back of the speaker that allows air to go up and down through the center of the speaker. But the, the metal part is not what is creating the heat. 
it is pulling the heat. It acts like a heat sink, very much like a uh, like an amplifier would uh, has a heat sink for the electronic components on the inside. The component that's creating the heat is the voice coil itself, which is in very close proximity to the metal. So the, the coil gets hot, the metal pulls that heat away from it, and then the airflow on the inside of the pole vent would get rid of some of that heat. What PVAC does, as well as some other technologies, um, like in the W7, we have the radial drilled pole piece that takes those that airflow that goes up through the center of the speaker, and instead of just going up and down, it actually curves it in towards where the heat is being generated, the voice coil itself. So it's a more efficient way of using the motion of the speaker to pull and push that war that pull in cool air and eject warm air on the inward and outward motion of the speaker. It's a more efficient way of doing it. On the W6V3, we found another way of executing that radial type uh, cooling circuit that's shown so well right here. So uh, again, my joke is, is still valid. It's a really cool technology intended not only for reliability, but for performance as well, because the speaker will change its parameters if that voice coil gets hot. So if you can keep it cooler, you can keep it more consistent and hence the quality performance that we get from these higher level products. So I love hot air for now, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Now, FCAM, um, that's a channel on the voice call. You can see it in this uh, cutaway diagram there. So there's that little channel that goes all the way around um, the, uh, <clears throat> the voice coil former there and the spider assembly and the adhesive is applied in that channel. Then the cone surround uh, as an assembly is set in. And this really ensures a perfect alignment of the moving parts um, so there isn't any unwanted stress on the parts. If the cone wasn't in complete alignment, you got to think about uh, maybe on the left side, it would pull a little bit more and that would be your weakest uh, link on there. So you don't want to have any points of major stress. You want everything to be in completely alignment so that way your suspension is not binding on one side or the other or anything like that. You can think about it exactly as a suspension on anything else. You don't want any binding. And this F-cam really helps align everything down so it's centered and there's no binding on any side of the suspension and everything moves in perfect alignment and in harmony with one another. Which is normally not a problem for a speaker that doesn't have high excursion. Right. <laughs> the lower level products. And I don't mean to be diminishing any of those products, but if, if the suspensions are not absolutely ideal and the speakers only move it a tenth of an inch, it's not that big of a deal. It's still important, mind you, because there are tolerances. But when you're trying to swing an inch and a quarter, two inches, that, that's not easy to do. So any issues that are going to cause that voice coil to rock inside a very small uh, magnetic gap, it could be problematic. So FCAM, I've always struggled with trying to make uh, this technology uh, clear to people because it's so heady in terms of this is the way we build the product that matters to you in terms of reliability because we know exactly what you're going to do with it. So we've actually developed a new way of building the product so that our product could be more reliable in those circumstances. It's really hard to convey. Just trust me, it helps a lot. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then speaking of the long excursion on there, when you have a long excursion, it's not only the suspension you got to worry about, but the uh, the lead wires you have to kind of figure out too. Um, engineered lead wire system is basically what we do is we make sure that when we're looking at the lead wire system into the driver, we're taking account the entire um, the entire driver. It's not an afterthought. These are engineered when this speaker is being designed. It's not the speakers here. Now what are we going to do with the lead wires on there? And we take a look at, at the, these ones actually step up to a ribbon lead wire on the W6V3. Um, and these were into engineered into the design to be quiet and reliable during those demanding really high excursion situations that you guys are putting them through, like Steve talked about, an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, uh, two inches. Um, many times the lead wires, if they are an afterthought, they can lead to pro poor performance, either from being noisy, from slapping against the back of the cone, or maybe they're sewn into the uh, spider itself, and then it has either a shortened lifestyle or it's hindering the suspension itself too, um, you have some sort of performance compromise there. So by engineering these while the speaker is being designed and designing the lead wires into the uh, subwoofer design, it really does help 
minimize uh, any issues on there. And it's, it's those things that you don't realize how important they are until they go wrong, right? <laughs> and, exactly. and that's so you get a subwoofer and you're hearing a ticking on the backside of it while you're playing in, in really high extreme uh, size, you don't realize how important doing this is. Um, and this ribbon style is extremely helpful, especially with the high excursion. And, and Steve and I had a really good conversation on this uh, yesterday, I believe. Um, the lead wires tend to act as jump ropes when you're starting to move them that much in those high excursion situations that we talk about. Um, so having them as uh, a ribbon really keeps them tidy, keeps them um, separated from one another and insulated from one another. So you don't have any of that jump roping, no shorting that's going on. And it just keeps everything nice and tidy on there, which will... Uh, We'll step in and show you the uh, the jumper lead system on there also, which keeps that wiring system really nice and tidy on there too. I don't know if anyone can guess what the number one most visited help center article is by <laughs> far. Um, <laughs> But I'll say that this jumper system helps simplify the wiring configuration for dual voice coil setup. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so just one point of clarity, there's, there's, although we've executed it, I think, in a cool way, there's nothing different about this dual voice coil than any other. We've just put the two terminals on one side of the speaker instead of opposite sides of the speaker. So that's not the, the, the really neat thing. The really neat thing is how we've executed it on that little jumper system there. It makes it a lot easier to, to follow along with, with all of it, I think, anyway. Um, and just for the record, for, for simplicity, when you, when you have... A, you know, a voice coil former like my, my soda can here, uh, you can, you, you start uh, running a wire around it and you wire it all the way down to the bottom, but you can't terminate the wire at the bottom. So it's got to go back up. So very often they'll put another layer of wire on the top. So they have the lead wires that come out for a two layer coil, one that goes down, one that goes up and then out. A typical uh, dual voice coil will have another one that's wound on top of that, where it starts at the top, goes down to the bottom and comes back out. So you have two lead wires on one side, two lead wires on the other for a dual voice coil, in that case, a four layer coil. It's not the only way to do it, mind you, but that's you know one of the more common ways of doing it. So all we did was we'd move the lead wires over to the other side. So dual voice coil, that's all we're talking about. Two connection points on a multi-layer coil. Typically it's gonna be four layer, um, but you can actually have a single four layer coil done the same way. It's not had the separate tap. The separate tap gives you flexibility, which the little jumper system that Kevin's talking about here is what you're after with a lot of these dual voice coils. So with the JL Audio product line, it's very uncommon that we have a dual voice coil that has a higher power handling. That's not why we do it. We're doing it for flexibility. We also have single voice coils that have a lot of layers in it that can handle you know, similar power or sometimes even more power than you might expect. So I just want to make that clear that the jumper system and the flexibility is most of the reason why we do dual voice coil. Yeah, and this, this jumper system, as an installer uh, background on here, when I take a look at this, first of all, like Steve mentioned, having both um, voice coil connections on one side of the driver um, is is very, very nice. Um, it's going to simplify the wiring on there for me. I'm not going to have to worry about uh, running a wire to the other side of the subwoofer or anything like that. But this jumper system on here also takes it another step further with simplifying that installation process. Um, one, it's going to simplify the mind that I have to think about, well, if I'm going to do this in a parallel configuration or a, a series uh, configuration on there. And like I said, if you guys didn't guess, wiring up a dual voice coil subwoofer is our number one most visited help center article. And it is the most visited help center article <laughs> times two. The next one is, is half the, less than half the views uh, of what the uh, DVC one is on there. So having that thought process and being able to just look at the jumpers simplifies uh, that installation, that wiring configuration on there. But also now you have one pair of speaker wires that's just going right directly to the, the, that one connection point rather than having a second set of uh, terminals on the other side. 
man, it just makes it so much easier and so much cleaner in the box. You're not having to double up a speaker wire inside each one of those terminals to run to the other one if you're uh, if you're paralleling it. So it makes it nice and easy. Again, um, both of those technologies really come into play by keeping the uh, the terminal on one side and then also the jumper system uh, being able to wire it up nice and easy. And they do come with the jumper. So it makes it again nice and easy for that installation. For my OC, with my OCD, there's nothing that drives me more insane than an enclosure with a plexi back or if you have the baskets, you know, coming out of the enclosure and you see that ugly speaker wire wrapping around the basket to go from one coil to the other. And I right. just drive me nuts. And that terminal design makes it look so clean. It does. It does. It does. So um, the the uh, detachable trim ring on here can be customized to match the install, which is nice. It gives it that little extra touch of, uh, of customization. Um, we also have a separate grill available to protect the drivers. Um, since they do have so much excursion on them, you'll notice that this grill is fairly deep on there. Um, and that way, if it is in the back of an SUV or something like that, where groceries may be thrown in on, you may want to put grills on them just to protect the cone of the driver and the, uh, the surround, all of that good stuff. Um, and certainly my usual comments about you don't have to actually buy the grill, but use the grill to space it out to make sure that your area around the driver is uh, free and clear. So when the speaker is moving, it doesn't hit anything. Now, we prefer that you have some protective measure. We do offer the grill for that purpose, right. but you can also use it as a, as a template to make sure your boundaries are, are far enough away. Yep, absolutely. Um, this one's pretty cool. This install here um, came to us from uh, JT um, from Automotive Entertainment HB. He uh, customized the trim rings on this install to match the enclosures inserts there. So he painted those up to match the aluminum uh, hexagon patterned inserts that he has throughout that enclosure there. And I gotta say, man, four of these, and this looks like a pickup truck by the back window in that. Got a hammer. This guy, <laughs> this guy is, is into excursion, I'm sure, right there. He wants to listen to it loud. So, so let's take a look at some of the specifications um, here. We're gonna compare the W3V3 to uh, the W6V3. So what exactly do you uh, gain um, from making that step between those two drivers there? Um, and we'll go in and show you here. Excursion's a big one. Um, what was interesting to me is when we took a look at the 10W3 and the original, uh, or not the original, but the V2, uh, W6 uh, V2, there wasn't that much excursion difference between the two of them. So when we went to the W6 V3 and we got all the way up to that three quarters of an inch excursion on there, it really did make that big difference um, of piston displacement on there. Um, one thing that steps out to me is you kind of notice that the SD is the actual um, square inches of cone area. It's a little bit smaller on the W6 V3. And can anybody guess why that is? Oh, I know. Okay, <laughs> tell me, because we haven't heard from you lately. <laughs> now we'll see what the what the crowd has to say first. <laughs> so while, while we're waiting for that answer, somebody did make a, a mention earlier about the white accent ring around the, the cone. So since we have a moment, I'll, I'll just share with you. You have no idea how much we sweated that detail. Uh, basically, we have uh, a sub cone underneath the visible, um, what we call as the dust cap. So there's like a dish uh, that goes on the front of it, which is what you most uh, you, you see mostly. Uh, but the sub cone underneath, we had the option to make that black as well. But the problem that you run into there is you have a black surround, you know, the rubber surround, you have the black dish, and then you have the black cone as a substrate underneath. And it'd be very hard to get those three materials to really match. So Lucio and the team came up with the idea, why don't we make that like an accent color? So then it came, what color do we make it? So we don't want to go too crazy and you know too you know fancy with the color. We wanted something that would match a lot of installations really nicely, and that's how we wound up with a. It's, it's I don't know if it's exactly white, but it's kind of that uh, offset color, that um, you know off white color. Uh, and I think it, you're right. Whoever made that comment, who was that? That's uh, Philip. Uh, Philip made yeah. that comment. I agree. I think it looks really sharp. So, yeah. so <laughs> we, exactly. we do have some answers coming in. Uh, Glenn Savage saying the larger surround. There you go. And uh, Ben saying uh, the rubber surround and greater excursion. And we get that greater excursion because of that larger surround. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Good job, guys. So when we take a look at that, because it does have so much more excursion, when we take a look at the actual displacement of the driver, and this is how much air, this is the displacement of how much air the driver is actually moving, not how much displacement it takes up in an enclosure. So keep that in mind. This is the piston displacement and how much air is being compressed and rarefied um, from each driver here. And when we take a look, the 10W or the 10W3V3 to jump from a 10W3V3 to a 12W6V3, you're actually getting twice the amount of uh, of displacement there. So you're getting uh, a, <clears throat> not double the output, but you're going to get a good 3 dB increase out of that. So keep that in mind. You're getting a lot more output out of these guys when you step up into them. They just have so much more excursion, even though it's a smaller piston area because of that surround on there, you are getting a lot more output out of these W6 V3s, but you got to put the power to them. And that's uh, when we take a look at the power handling, they do handle quite a bit more power um, than what our uh, 12 W3 V3, we're 100 watts more power on there. So they do handle that, uh, that quite better. Now, this when we take a look at the sealed enclosures, because that's what we talk about when, when we talk about these guys, they have the performance, but they also work in small enclosures on there too. They actually fit in smaller enclosures than their W3 counterparts there. So when we take a look at the 10s and 12s in comparison between the two of them, they're actually smaller sealed enclosures when you step up to that W6 V3 uh, line. And that smaller enclosure space really allows these W6 uh, to be tucked away. Um, this one's actually tucked in underneath the rear deck, leaving the trunk nice and open. Um, when we consider that mounting depth, and, and we've touched on this a few times, when we consider that mounting depth required by the driver, this box is extremely concealed underneath of there. And you can only imagine it's not going to be very, very wide. It's not going to be need to be very, very wide or very, very tall in there um, because you do have that airspace from the mounting depth on there. That's a fantastic sounding car, by the way. I got a listen to it uh, when I was in Phoenix before our travel was halted back in March. And uh, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Daryl gave a good demo. So I, I know that, impressions, that's, uh, that's who build it. They do a great job down there um, in that Phoenix market too. So. Kevin's got more to share, but I, I do want to get into the story because you know uh, Rob mentioned about Daryl's car sounding so good. Daryl Chapman's one of our key people over in our Phoenix location where our amplifier engineering and um, a lot of those efforts are, are being managed. Daryl's been with us forever and he's a legend in the industry. Um, but what's interesting is for many, many years since our company is located here in Southern Florida, most of the cars that we did and most of the demonstrations demonstrations that we did were coming out of Florida. Well, the guys in Phoenix, where they're making the amplifiers and doing all that stuff, they're like, you know, we could do this too. So there became this little bit of a battle between Florida and Phoenix, you know, who's going to build the better cars? Uh, you know, I don't like admitting this, but you know, we have some really awesome cars down here in Florida, but they overcompensated. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we got here? So over my shoulder here, this is George Babers. He, he's one of our key guys over at the Phoenix location. And now you have Daryl's car. Uh, you can see that they really went over the, the, they overshot it. They they went completely hog wild. I got a caddy out there with uh, four AW sevens in it. They yeah. completely overcompensated. And you're right; these cars do sound really good. They've done an excellent job. So I like the little battle that we have going on between the two locations. <laughs> it's fun. We're gonna get the Portland guys involved, right? <laughs> right. So we've gone through the driver. We've talked about um, the enclosures and all of that stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the power on them. Um, these are some recommendations, and I'm going to put the largest asterisk known to man right here on a, <laughs> in verbally. Um, these are truly just recommendations in there when designing a system, um, especially when you're getting into these larger drivers like the W6 V3. You have a lot to consider. You can't just throw a HD or slash 1201 in a into like a 96 Geo Metro and expect that electric system to keep up with the demand. Um, anybody that's doing something like that is going to probably be what we would consider an abusive listener. They're going to want to play these things loud and they're going to draw a lot of current. Um, so make sure that you are um, setting up the electrical system or designing the system around what the car's electrical system will handi handle on there. A demanding listener um, by default 
default, like we said, man, they're just going to be harder on that electrical system. So make sure when you guys are designing the system, either for your customer or for yourself, um, that you're taking that into consideration. Um, a single uh, amplifier on each driver, the uh, VXI 601Is, to me, it's going to be a very simple setup. So that way you know that your input sensitivity and output um, level trim and everything is matched very closely to one another. So that's kind of an easier install. So personally, to me, that's the route I would go with it. Um, and they draw a lot less current than if you had an HD 1201 in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the option's there. And a lot of systems that we see being built with these are being built with the HD 1201 on there. I threw the slash 1201 V3 in there just because I... Hey, we well, got legacy on us, so, so you got to include it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about rich history. There's a, there's a rich history amplifier for us. About. So to summarize what Kevin sharing with us, obviously electrical concerns are always in place, especially when you start talking about these bigger amplifiers, which a product like a W6 or a W7, those higher level products were almost always, it's like moths to flames. We always go to the big amplifiers. So the, the huge asterisks are, we're talking about the woofer here. So uh, when you're talking about the amplifier, make sure you're paying attention to all of those things. Feed the beast, whatever it may be. What yep. we're doing here is kind of guiding you towards a really good choice for what's going to get great performance from a W6 V3. Great performance and built into that is reliability. We're going to make recommendations that we feel are going to be reliable and give you the results that you're looking for in terms of performance. That's the goal. Always 100%. That's the goal. Yeah, and if you're doing two of them and you don't have a huge electrical system that's on there, uh, my personal recommendation would be just go with the HD 751. Um, yeah. The power difference between those two, the customer is really not going to hear a large difference um, between the, the two amplifiers. Um, there will be a difference between them, but it's not going to be double the output or anything like that, but it's going to be a lot less draw on the electrical system and everything's going to run a lot cleaner and, uh, and all of the equipment's going to be a lot happier at that point in time. So HD 751 is a great piece, especially if you're not doing a huge electrical upgrade or anything like that. Right on. So the applications and uses, um, this is the fun part um, where we use the W6 V3s um, in many different applications. Um, and I appreciate not only what we have to offer as enclosures and all of that cool stuff, but also what you guys have been doing with the subwoofers too. Um, a lot of the subs that we have talked about um, in, different, uh, in, in different sessions there, we have built a lot of enclosures for these ones are pretty cool because a lot of custom enclosures are being done with these w6 v3s they kind of hit that barrier where we do have some cool enclosures and they work very well and they're very uh, application specific like steve said um because that's how we kind of do things but oh, we're cool. <laughs> general systems out there you guys have done some great jobs with some great installs and we appreciate it and we appreciate you guys sending them in. I'm gonna start off with the Pro Wedge. Uh, this, uh, the picture up here is the dual 12W6 V3. Um, it is extremely compact for the drivers that are in it. Um, 22 and a half inches long. Um, they are opposing drivers. Um, so they kind of help cancel the uh, vibrations and the movement of the closure um, during the higher output. Um, however, the weight of this thing will also help uh, well, movement in the vibrator. Going back out. Um, Shocking how heavy it is. <laughs> Compact and heavy. Yeah. <laughs> dense. Dense is a, is a good word for these, uh, these enclosures there. And you can see the uh, 2 ohm and 4 ohm, um, depending on what you're doing for a 12 inch option for single or dual on there. So to give you the options on there, these ones are actually my favorite. Um, when we take a look and I'm sure they're probably the favorite of many of you guys that are out there listening. I know quite of even internal right, yeah. guys, the HO boxes um, are, are, are just something we hear uh, a lot of talk about. I mean, they're just great enclosures. They sound great, but they have a lot of output with them. Obviously, in the name, high output, we wouldn't uh, give them that name if that's uh, not oh, what they did. Oh, oh. 
Um, but like I said, these are actually one of my favorites. And, and like I said, I know a lot of you guys out there like these enclosures too. They are ported enclosures on there. You can get them in a single 10 inch option or a single 12 inch option. Um, size wise, um, they're fairly, um, compact width wise on the driver there but they do have a little bit of depth on there you can see that port wraps all the way around and then comes out just above the driver there so great great boxes and you guys are probably all familiar with them if you haven't heard one of these definitely um visit your local retailer take a listen to them man these things really 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 good on and they still sound good. It's not just a boomy resonant box. It actually has really good fidelity to it as well. It just has a little extra love where you want it. You know, it's a, yeah, they're not peaky. Yeah. They're not extremely peaky on there. They're they're they get on it and they get on it at a very fluid yes, they do. Um, curve on there, like Steve said. Going actually real quick back to the pro edge uh, that we were talking about, yeah. where the the woofers that fire off to the side. If you have a smaller, you know, uh, a smaller SUV, um, one of those kind of hybrid, you know, types, uh, or a, a smaller hatchback vehicle, these are phenomenal enclosures in those types of cars. The way the woofers load off the side panels, um, these are probably my favorite enclosures that we build for those smaller SUV hatchback. Really good job, man. They, they load I've actually really, really nice. I've actually seen them in the back of like SUVs and whatnot behind that third row seat and they're just tucked mm -hmm. up there. And yes, it takes up some space, but it fits in the middle really nice and loads just as well, just like Rob is describing. Um, and that, that, is, that literally is by design. That's what the plan was with the opposing right. drivers like that to load on those side panels and get really good performance. That's why the logo's the way it is. <laughs> and Dale, um, Dale was asking about the HO enclosure, if it was made to complement the sub and yes, all of our enclosures are designed by our engineering team um, to get the optimum performance. And, you know, in many cases, they are designed at the same time as the driver. So yeah. if there's changes to the driver, they can make appropriate changes to the enclosure. But it's not as simple as just we know what the specs, recommended enclosure specs are, and here it is. You know, they'll build an enclosure and then they will listen to it in right. different types of vehicles. Because remember, the, the cabin gain and there's other acoustical issues that are going to change how the woofer performs. So they will listen to this enclosure in different vehicles, you know, open vehicles, hatchbacks, sealed trunks, and find a happy middle ground where the woofer will sound good in the different types of vehicles. So it's not just designing an enclosure that worked with just that specific driver, but also finding an enclosure that will properly perform in the different types of vehicles that it may be installed in. And the work that goes into the enclosures really is no different than the work that goes into the speaker itself, the subwoofer, uh, amplifiers. You know, it's a ground up design, uh, you know, to really be a, you know, in this case, a more universal application than something like the Stealth Box, which Kevin will talk about next. But to make sure in those universal applications, it's going to sound proper no matter what that vehicle may be. Right, on. right. And they're not only tuned uh, specifically for the driver with airspace and with with the port length and port uh, size and all of that. But also, you know, we take a look at how that box is going to fit in different vehicles too. not only how it's going to sound, but hey, what's the best way we can maximize the universal fitment? Um, for an enclosure like this. So this one's kind of narrow um, on the width wise. So that way it can be put into a lot of uh, areas there. And if you take a look at the different offerings of the HO boxes, um, they do vary in different sizes, not because a woofer may necessarily need that different um, design but because they're kind of application like i know we beat that drum a lot but we, we really think about the applications and where or how these are going to put in what kind of vehicles um, whether it's a hatchback most used for or whether it's going to be a, a suburban most used for or anything like that and we really kind of tailor that to that type of application so when we talk about stealth boxes, like uh, 
like uh, Rob said there, this is our next step here. We do have a few applications um, for the W6V3 in Stealth Box. Um, we have a H2, H2 Hummer and a 15 Camaro. There's a few others that have come and gone over the years. Um, the depth of the W6V3 and the evolution of shallow subwoofers in the lineup really have kind of... Um, I don't want to say minimize the use of the W6V3 in stealth uh, box applications, um, but they have taken over those uh, those applications and vehicles also not always have that depth to be able to work with and still tuck a subwoofer away on there too. So the vehicles over the years and the performance of shallow mount subwoofers that has, uh, that has brought up over the years, um, kind of minimized what we use W6V3 in stealth box applications. Certainly the, the shallow mount and the application aspect is there, but uh, let's be honest, there's a cost issue as well. Yeah. You know, five less enclosure with a W6 driver in it, <clears throat> it gets expensive. And at some point, shops like, you know, Glenn and a number of the guys that are on the call now, on uh, the, the session now, they can probably build some really good enclosures and, and make it match even better. So as good as we are with the stealth boxes, it becomes a performance to dollar ratio. And we found that on the higher level product with the kind of performance you can get from a W6, a lot of shops are doing a really good job of executing to a very high level. So yeah, we do make a number of options that we think are really cool and we definitely give you the performance and there's a value relationship there, but between the, you know, what Kevin was sharing, the shallow mount drivers and the performance we can get, the more concealed versions of things. And you'll notice the, the vehicles that he mentioned, they tend to be larger vehicles or areas where like in this one that we could tuck it into that one corner and load really, really nicely. The cost of that enclosure, a shop might be able to build another box for two 10 inch woofers and maybe be at the same price. And then our, our customer might see that as a better value for whatever reason. So for us, it made sense to let our retailers start doing some really cool creative things with some of our flagship premium products. We have boxes, absolutely. Use them if you can. If not, let, let your retailer take care of that for you. They, they're doing some really great work. So let right. them do it. Absolutely. And if you do have the availability to, uh, to have a, uh, a Camaro um, that comes in or an H2 or something like that, these things get on it. So yeah. <laughs> they are stealth boxes and they are designed around that vehicle. Um, and, and like we said, they are an application piece. This box is specifically designed for this Camaro to preform or perform to its maximum potential. And, and they do get on it. So if you do have one and you don't wanna build a custom enclosure for it, you don't have to be worried about whether the W6 V3 is going to perform well in these uh, these applications because they do get on it um, with these stealth boxes. No doubt. So not every install has to be a crazy, super elaborate, um, lighted, LED, plexi install. Um, I wanted to show this one. Uh, this is Chris Mack from Car Toys. Um, he did this little Volkswagen Beetle um, small hatchback with two W6V3s in the back there, um, running off an HD. And I can only imagine how much output this has. <laughs> Be <laughs> in that little cabin in there. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Um, and, and we may not think of the W6V3s as a great under seat solution. Um, Dan Hall did this enclosure. And again, man, I'm sure this gets on it. Uh, four tens underneath the seat of a pickup truck. It's clean. It's functional and, uh, and very, very simple on there. Now, some guys did send in some big plexi uh, lighted up cool installs. Um, and again, I can only imagine the output this thing has. Again, it's a smaller truck. Um, he's taken up some good space on there. He's got some down firing four um, drivers on there with some nice plexi, some nice lighting. Did a really nice job uh, really good, resetting yes. the amps into the uh into the amp rack there, making everything nice and clean on there. And so, no yeah. visible speaker wires, thanks to our terminal jumper system. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting for this slide, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> 
So great job, guys. I appreciate everybody sending these in. Um, and we're just really quick recap. Obviously, these guys are all engineered and built uh, in Miramar, Florida. Work, like we said, really well in small enclosures, whether it's sealed or ported. Um, they do work well in ported enclosures also. Um, they are performance driven. So when you guys are designing the system, make sure you are designing the system around the needs of that driver. So that way your uh, expectations of the customer are going to be good and the longevity of the entire system is just uh, right on par with everything there. And really with the W6 V3, I mean, the legend continues that W6 Legacy um, is one of the most popular high output subwoofers um, and, and the subwoofer that really allowed uh, JL or, or who we are to become who we are or what we are today. So we wow. appreciate the adoption um, from the masses that have come along with the W6 nomenclature. Um, and and we appreciate the using and, and what you guys are doing with these things. And and hopefully you guys are all happy with the outputs and, and, and the performance and the, uh, the longevity. Obviously, some of the, uh, the even the V1s that I showed there um, from Antonio's truck. That's a recent install. Um, so the longevity of those drivers too is there. No doubt. Well, Kevin, awesome job covering that. Guys, I'm real sorry. We went so long. Um, but it looks like you guys stuck with us and I appreciate that for sure. Uh, I cautioned you at the very beginning that we've run long. <laughs> it's, there's just so much history with the W6 line. Uh, I had so much insight into what those guys were doing on those early days. I'll take all the credit if you want, but I, I was just a fly on the wall watching a lot of that stuff. So uh, as we went into the version two and then into the, the version three, that, that was just really cool to be able to take that legacy of the W6 and bring it all the way through. And uh, Kevin was just sharing the fact that that it's still being embraced and it's still such an important part of our overall business. And, you know, guys love it. And, you know, that makes us feel really good. We used to kid around as, you know, buy all you want, we'll make more because we love making this stuff. And that, that ap application specific nature of our entire brand um, it really comes through in everything that Kevin shared, especially as we went through the enclosures. And what I really liked is the fact that he showed a, a bunch of different types of applications of the, the product. And that just shows creativity and flexibility, and I love seeing it. So we are in the Q&A. Um, obviously, we've gone long, and if you guys just wanted to drop off, totally understand. It was you know, definitely the longest session we've done in quite some time. Um, <laughs> we knew this was going to be the case. We knew. And you know, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> So uh, it looks like you know, guys have stuck with us. You know, we still have a large number of people following right now, so that's really good. Um, so let, let's get on to some of the Q&A stuff, Rob. Is there anything yes. that's to the top? First of all, a, a common question that came up, and it, you know, when's there going to be a W6 V4? When's there going to be a W8? When's there going to be this? We have no idea. <laughs> I mean, our to, it, honestly, our engineering team keeps a lot of what they're working on to themselves. We know they're always working on cool stuff, but we don't know what it's going to end up being. And, uh, you know, in recent years, our company's really taken a different stance to not announce products and not announce what we're working on until it's ready. Steve joked earlier about the W7 being shown four years before we shipped it. And, you know, it, it can upset people. They get excited about it and then it doesn't come. So, you know, we've really, as a company, tried to take a better, do a better job of not showing or talking about stuff un until it's ready. And I think that's a win for everyone. So I don't know what engineering's working on, uh, whether it's speaker or on the electrical side, but no, we are constantly developing new products. We have lots of ideas, a very talented team that really wants to, you know, take all of this amazing stuff that's already, in my opinion, next level to the next level. So, you know, just know we're always working and when we're ready to show it to you, you're going to know about it. But I think it's a testament to, to you know, all the engineering that we've talked about today and, and the on-site production that you can have a product that has a 10-year shelf life, you know, almost 20-year shelf life when we're talking about the W7. You know, we're going to have an AEV2 in the next year, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, when you design it right, you build it right it lasts forever and you know we're not just gonna rush to replace it uh you know to change the color or do something if we're gonna do it it's gonna be pretty much a ground up you know far improved product so um you know i don't know what lies in the future but no we're always working on cool stuff yeah and and further to that everything rob just said is absolutely dead on um 
the, the, when we're working on stuff, we are, we're working on stuff. It may not actually be a product. A lot of times our engineers are working on concepts and ideas of how to do things differently or better or whatever the case may be. And very often those ideas will lead to a product that we didn't actually say, we're going to go make a, this. Um, that's exactly how the W7 was created. It was an idea. They were trying to you know, vet out different ideas in terms of how can we do better cooling? How can we improve the suspensions? How can we do this? How can we do that? And at some point in the, in the process of you know, chasing down each one of these ideas, the guys you know, kind of looked at each other and said, you know what? We can actually make one of these. And that's where the W7 became a W7. It's not like they sat down and said, let's make a W7. They sat down and said, how can we do these things better? And they put them all together and that was the W7. And like uh, Kevin and Rob shared earlier, we learned so much from that, that that's now become just a part of who we are as a company throughout. And that's the way it goes, which is why it's very difficult to tell you what we're actually working on, because it's not really a product yet. <laughs> if it becomes a product, you'll know it when you see it. And there's lots of work being done, even in these crazy times, lots and lots of stuff is being done. Our engineering team has not skipped a beat at all. I do see some chatter regarding like seeing our team in action. And I saw someone make a comment about um, us being super locked down. The, the truth is we're pretty open with a lot of what we're doing. Um, obviously going into the engineering, we call it the bowels of engineering. When you go deep in there, there are some things that we prefer not to show you. And it really goes more down to what Rob was saying that we, we don't want to get you all excited about something that may or may not come to market. But there's lots of cool stuff that's being done, and we are pretty open. You know, when when times are, are better, we will be doing tours of our Miramar facility for sure. Yeah. Um, and eventually, you know, maybe you know, the truth is in uh, Phoenix and in Portland, it's it's really engineering offices. And Office it's, while it's exciting for geeks in terms of like kind of showing how things are done, there's dudes working at a desk, and you know, they're they're either designing something or you know, focus on a circuit design or whatever the case may be. And it's not as cool as you might think it is unless you're like really geeky. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So starting at the top of the feed, Matt had a question uh, asking us to explain uh, the W cone design. And I think that kind of comes from an earlier question that I can't bring up now because Steve's stories went so long, I can't scroll that far <laughs> up. But the significance of the W in our, in our woofer names, W7, W6. And I was mentioned that W Cone is part of that. And I know you were there when these were being named, Steve. So maybe you can uh, go a little into the naming and then um, uh, maybe it's a, a brief description of the W Cone. Sure. Well, the, you know, the, the letter W is it was very carefully chosen for a woofer. Uh, that's really where it comes from. <laughs> so some of the early products we had like an 8W2, an 8W3, a 10W2. These are ancient, ancient models. But the W stood for woofers because we also had component speakers. That's where the C come from. So today we still have like C5, C3, C, you know, C7. Uh, th that's where those names come from. So there's nothing more than that on, on, on those things. So very often when you see a letter in the middle, it usually refers to the type of product that it is. Now the W cone, it, it's unfortunate that it kind of has the, you know, the same W portion, but um, I think I saw in the chat that someone was describing it um, as an architectural solution where the, the an upper dish to the W7 uh, specifically, and the, the lower cone actually goes down, comes back up, and it goes down again, almost like the shape of the letter W, and yes, the upper dish yeah. creates like a sandwich of it. Uh, no one likes when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's almost like cardboard. Now, you're probably thinking your W7 is like a piece of cardboard. <laughs> it's not like that. What, what cardboard is, it's it's paper is really all it is, but it gets strength and you could put really heavy things. You could park a car on top of cardboard because of the geometry of the way it's all put together. And they're using the, 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 um, the inner structure of the pieces of paper to make it significantly stronger without making it significantly heavier. So a lot of what you see in the W cone on the W7 and various other products are coming from an architect's point of view of how we make this incredibly strong without adding significant amounts of weight and geometry. And the W cone allows us to do that. It disperses that. And uh, the other part of it is that when a voice cord is pushing up at the base of the W cone, the energy is, is going up both sides of the W instead of just at a single contact point. It's displacing that energy and driving the piston in a better way. So there's lots of stuff going on with that. Um, hopefully that was brief enough. Hopefully it was complete enough. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was a good answer. Let's see. Do, do, do. I'm trying to scrolling down. I had notes. Let's see. We talked about single amps. 
Lots of people asking Glenn Savage questions. Glenn, you're a, a popular man. Eric John came out of the woodwork to join us today. Whoa. He must have, he must have been in hiding and crying after his 49ers <laughs> lost again to my Seahawks last weekend and, uh, you know, didn't make the playoffs. So, yeah, we don't talk about not making playoffs down here in Florida. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> golf, so close. You almost had it. It was a nail biter up in Buffalo, huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's see. Where did all these questions go? Here's an interesting one also from Matt um, saying that he's heard from a lot of people that the W6 is better suited for SQ applications where the W7 line um, is more of like, I hear people say the W7 is more of an SPL. So can we elaborate on uh, is W6 better suited for sound quality over the W7 and why or why not is it? Okay, um, I could be simple and, and short on this, but I won't be. Uh, the simple answer is the W7 is the best sounding speaker that we make, best, best of all for a period that we make. Sound quality, absolutely the best. It also, has the highest excursion capability, uh, not only in terms of XMAX, but the physical capability. So it also has the highest potential of any subwoofer that we make. That is why it's our flagship, absolutely. What the W6 brings though, um, is something that's more akin to like what I would consider a normal speaker. And I know that sounds very braggadocious and I apologize for that, but the W7 is a cut above. It is, it has some special sauce, so to speak, that make it very, very different. Uh, W6 is more conventional in its approach, and I think a lot of people pick up on that it sounds significantly better than than a really good speaker in a W3 V3. Uh, the 6 is definitely better than that. It's not quite to the level of the W7, but the W7 has this haunting sound to it that if you've never heard a speaker that sounds like that, it sounds different. And I'll share with you that uh, a story that Mandel and I were listening to some of the early W7s. We were listening to a vehicle, and it was back when we used to listen to music on those shiny round things. Um, coasters? I think they're coasters, yeah. So, something like that. so obviously CDs, and we would grab a bunch of CDs, and we went into this one vehicle where we had a, a system set up. Pop it in disc after disc, listening to tracks that we had listened to over the years that we were very familiar with. We wanted to hear what this this W7 was really all about. And we're listening to it and we're kind of looking at each other. And it's like, it sounds different. So different, that could be good or bad. So what is different? We didn't know. We don't want to say. So we're popping more discs in and hours are going by. We're just listening to it because we got to get ahead around what is different about this because, you know, he's got to market it. And, you know, together we got to train on it. We got to come out with, you know, how we're going to talk about this, this, this new product. And after a while, we're listening to the product and it's like, this is right. Th this is actually clear, crystal clear subwoofer performance, there's something missing, and what's missing is distortion. And again, I don't mean to be like condescending in any way. I'm talking about our own product at the time. The freedom from distortion at the W7 is so low at such a high level that it doesn't sound normal. It is right. W6 doesn't have as much of a difference between uh, the threshold. So it's not as clear, it's not as good as a W7, so it becomes more normal, and it sounds better because it does have less, just not as less. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, I think a lot of people yeah. went towards a W6 as a more comfortable sounding speaker that was better than anything else. When they listen to the W7, they're picking up on that it sounds different than everything else, and they're not sure if it's right or not. Um, I know that's how I felt about it, and I, I do think that the W6 is the go-to sound quality woofer for many, many different reasons, and we've already gone too long tonight. So when we do the W7 training, I'll get into that a little bit more, um, and I know that was one of the questions. Why don't we do one of these for the W7? Because if we went two hours on this, so <laughs> so it's a lot of work. Yeah, 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 it's a lot of work, and there's a lot to cover. Because as uh, Rob and Kevin have mentioned several times, the the development of the W7 is foundational to every single product that we've done since. So we we're not going to sell that short end by any by any stretch. Plan on that one being even longer than this potentially. So. One thing I, I did see a question in there somebody had brought up and and I kind of breezed over it earlier because of timing wise, um, but comparing they they asked if they would be better off going with two two uh, W6s or one W7. Um, the W7 doesn't have double the displacement of a W6. So you would get more output out of two uh, W6 drivers. So just keep that in mind. Um, 
it's close. I mean, it, it's getting up there with the with the d- displacement on the W7. Um, you're looking on a 12 W7, you have about 193 um, cubic inches of, uh, of displacement. On a 12 W6, you have 113. Um, so it is quite a bit more displacement out of a W7, but it's not double. So adding that second driver in, you're still going to get more output. But again, different uh, tonality between the, I don't want to say tonality, but different performance out of the drivers. Um, You're going to have a little bit different listening experience with them too. So like Steve mentioned earlier there, but uh, I would listen to the W7 before I made my decision on there. Um, If you want to add another W6 to it, um, you're not going to be missing out for sure. Right. It, It comes down to what your performance expectations are. Right. So uh, another question I saw come up, and there was some chatter about this, is um, why don't we do bandpass enclosures like we do did in the 90s? And um, I, there's a couple reasons. This one's targeted at me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, <You're> the, <laughs> I don't know if I can say this without uh, <laughs> it still be nice. <laughs> so what Pierre is referring to back in the '90s, um, you know, bandpass enclosures were very, very common. They're, um, an interesting way of getting um, a, a degree of performance. Uh, in a pretty cool looking enclosure. Um, this is a pet peeve and Rob sent me a private comment when this question came up. He said, ah, oh, there's your podcast question. Uh, <laughs> so for me, it's a bit of a pet peeve because I do I do find a time and a place for bandpass enclosures. Uh, they're just less common now than they used to be. The bigger pet peeve that I have is when we refer to bandpass enclosures by order, fourth order, seventh order, you know, whatever. Um, the term order usually is referring to uh, the um, a rate of attenuation or a, a slope, um, like for a crossover, you have a second order crossover, third order crossover, whatever the case may be. And we take that order uh, terminology and we apply it towards um, what's known as an analogous circuit for enclosure design. And it works up into a point. So like uh, you'll have a, a sealed enclosure, which will be a certain order, a ported enclosure, which will be a certain order. So in those cases, you have a second and a third order uh, slope, right? So if you combine those two, if you have a sealed chamber and a ported chamber, you don't just add them up and come up with a fifth order enclosure. It's not how it works. Uh, you know, it, it's not one slope that's that's doing the job. So I prefer to talk about bandpass as a, uh, a single vented, you know, single reflex bandpass enclosure. Is a bandpass enclosure with a sealed chamber and a ported chamber, and you listen to the sound out of the ported chamber. There's other versions of it where there's two ported chambers, one that ports out behind the speaker, one that ports out in front of the speaker. Then there's a series tuned one that goes in. But all of that notwithstanding, the reason why they're not as common now is the need to channel energy uh, isn't as great as it used to be. There's other things that we can do to get energy where we need it. So that's one thing. The other thing is that band passes, while they can add some performance advantages in terms of output, every single box that you ever use will have some type of a compromise. Um, People like to think that a sealed enclosure is the best enclosure, and certain applications that is, but for someone that's asking about a band pass, the sealed enclosure ain't going to cut it because they're usually looking for output. Um, So Pierre probably remembers back in the day, we used to make some really good-looking band pass enclosures for some of our drivers, and they did sound really, really good because our engineers worked really hard to not tip the balance of compromise too far away from overall performance in favor of just being loud. I'm fine with bandpass, so long as you're not tipping the scales too heavily in one or the other. Um, it just balances is the name of the game. Our tech team can help you design bandpass enclosures, but from a production point of view, they're just not as viable as they once were. I'll never say never, but it's unlikely you'll see them come back. Yeah, unless you have a, a, a vehicle like a Bentley where you need to vent in through a small hole somewhere or something like that. Really, I would stick to the basics and, and go from there. Sorry. <laughs> Josh, I know what you did. <laughs> I kept on contemplating. I was like, should I or should I not? <laughs> All right. I think we'll do, um, just on the enclosure topic, uh, Kevin, Rob, and I have been talking recently about some of the other trainings that we can do. And we did talk about getting into the conversation about the different types of enclosures. And judging from what I'm seeing in the chat and the dialogue that we're having now, I think that's something that we should try to stream through um, whenever we can. Let's uh, kind of figure out when we can schedule that in. I think that'd be fun. Hmm. I wonder, like, if there was a magical box out there. 
I wonder. There's a myth about it somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. A myth? <laughs> Sounds like that could be a training topic. It could be. <laughs> All right. Um, Sacktown Steve was asking in terms of sound quality and output, how would a 12, to 12 TW3 stack up against a 12W6 V3? Assuming, of course, both subs are uh, in uh, spec ported or sealed enclosures. Mm -hmm. That counts. Uh, he, he's a regular on these things, and he always has really good questions. And he's smart enough to know to qualify his question. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll take it a little bit further for you, Steve. Um, if the same amount of power is being applied, it's likely that the two would be very, very similar. Um, the box volume requirements, going from the old man's memory here, are about the same on the 12TW3 and the 12W6. Um, Kevin, I think you're looking at the numbers. It looks like you're looking at the numbers. I was I wasn't no I know they are pretty close to one another. Hold on, I can. Well, that being the case, for a given amount of signal, the piston size is going to be about the same ish, right? And the excursion, if you're using the same amount of power, true power, not just rated power, because it can change with the different impedances. Um, if the same amount of power is being applied in the same type of enclosure, the same size enclosure with a similar piston, the actual SPL is going to be similar. Um, now the fidelity is going to be slightly different. Uh, you know, I'd give the edge to the W6 V3 at that point because there's so much of what's been done with the motor structure and many other aspects of it. In terms of fidelity, there will be an advantage to the W6 V3. In terms of output, watt for watt, same size speaker, same type of enclosure, same size enclosure is going to be about the same. Where the real advantage comes in is when you start powering up. When you start hitting the W6 V3 with more power, you will get more excursion capability because it can. And as a result, it will play louder. And because it is so special being a W6 V3, it will not compromise any of that sound quality at those higher levels. That's where the magic comes in. And that's a difficult thing to share with all of you because ideally as a company, we should be saying, buy the more expensive thing. It's always going to be better, but that's not always the case. You know, application truly is the name of the game. Um, so if you have need for a shallow woofer, TW3 all the way, no compromise there, no problem at all. But if you have a little bit of room for that larger, deeper speaker, and you want that extra output at that top end without uh, any added distortion or much added distortion, look to the deeper drivers like a W6 V3 or if you can, a W7. Um, but again, it's uh, th that application thing, beat that drum again. Let's find out what your ultimate goals are. We'll find a product that will help deliver it. We've got lots of options. Yep. The tens are actually spot on with one another um, for volume. When it goes to twelves, the twelve TW three actually will fit in a tiny bit smaller enclosure. Not okay. not by much. Uh, honestly, almost not worth mentioning. Yeah. There's another dark side of enclosure volume that um, comes in. That when we get into that training, we'll have to bring it up, and it has to do with efficiency. And I did see a question about efficiency. Um, it, it's bigger than what we can get into now, especially two hours in. Um, but, but efficiency is directly linked. If you're talking about low end extension, efficiency is going to be directly linked to enclosure volume. Smaller boxes will be less efficient if you're trying to get low frequency extension. So no matter what, if the box volume is smaller, you will see those numbers shift downward. If they don't shift downward, there's something else being done and it may be deceptive. Uh, but in our line, if, if you start looking at the products and you start looking at the recommended box volumes, if they have the same recommended box volume and they're the same size driver, you'll see that the efficiency values are going to be very, very similar. You'll also notice if you do any enclosure to, uh, um, enclosure modeling software uh, the, to determine uh, to predict the performance of um, a speaker in a box. If you look at the, uh, the response characteristics, the response curves, most of our recommendations, particularly in sealed boxes, are going to be um, almost exact overlays of each other. There's a reason for that. We know where you put them. Um, right. So, you know, for a given response characteristic, a smaller box will be less efficient, meaning it needs more power to play louder. That's physics. We can't get away from that. But because we're talking about W6, I can actually get on the soapbox that back in the day, those three 10 W6s we spoke about with only 600 watts, no one complained about a lack of output. However, the system was technically inefficient because the box volume was only 0.625 cubic feet per woofer only back then, right? <laughs> so again, don't 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 misinterpret efficiency for ultimate output capability. We have excursion capability, and we have lots of power at, at our fingertips now. That's not an issue. Don't worry about those efficiency numbers too much because it's more about the enclosure at that point than the ultimate output capability. 
in point six two five, if you think about that in the nineties for an enclosure size, it's almost half the size. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is seriously like your average 12 back then was probably a cube and a half, right? Maybe a cube and a quarter on the small size. Like, I mean, it's just like crazy to think about how far advanced those subwoofers are when they when they originally released. Without a doubt. And, you know, we weren't the only ones doing that. There was other companies, including some that have been mentioned in the chat, that back then were coming out with uh, speakers that were working in much smaller than normal enclosures because they realized too that that's a really good thing in cars because before all of this back in the you know mid 80s uh, in that time frame we didn't have mobile audio speakers we had pro sound speakers and home audio speakers that we were cramming into cars and trying to make them work and we realized that they can work well the box volumes were hideously large so we had to come up with a better way we had to give up something and what we gave up was efficiency but we got it to fit in a small box and play really great in the car i think that's a good trade off <laughs> We had a question from Chris about our assembly. I think I understand what he's asking here, but he says, why during assembly um, do we only place the motors assemblies at one point and then complete the subwoofer uh, later on? So um, it's a way, it really, it's about efficiency. Uh, every speaker that's built in house, a lot of pre-production work is done ahead of time prior to the line. So, you know, Kevin talked about um, these two really cool automated machines that assemble our motors ahead of time. And we also have an area um, for certain like W7 motors. Those are all done by hand because of their size, but it's about efficiency. You know, the more pre-built parts you have, the quicker it goes down the assembly line. Just like on a W7, the suspension is all one piece that just gets dropped into the frame on the assembly line but that's hand assembled previously in a different area of our facility. So by uh, pre-producing parts of the speaker, the final assembly goes a lot quicker and then we can build more products. And we so, you know, we'll take the motor and that really is the first step of assembly is the picture Kevin showed where they'll attach the motor and the frame together. Then they can drop in the suspension and do all the necessary adhesives soldering as it goes down the line. So really all that pre-production work is for efficiency. And, uh, you know, um, you know, we don't just build product to order. We do look at our inventory levels. Um, you know, we forecast how's power products moving and that then determines what products do get built uh, on that line. So we do build, uh, you know, you know, it could, depending on the day, you know, it could be, and the levels, we could build a couple hundred woofers on a, on a line that day and move to something else the next day. Or, you know, build those woofers for a couple of days, depending on what our inventory levels are like and what projected orders from our dealers and consumers are going to be. So uh, it's rapidly changing. But a lot of that yeah. pre-production stuff, it's just so we can build stuff in a quicker manner. And we do that through almost all aspects of the oh, company. Yeah. And honestly, most companies do some sort of similar thing throughout manufacturing. I mean, if you take a look at a car, a car engine is going to be assembled outside of the vehicle, then dropped into the vehicle when the vehicle's ready. Um, but And when we look at at us as a, as a manufacturer, I mean, even our wooden enclosures, we cut out the, the wood and get everything carpeted and then go ahead and store them flat up and laid out. Um, stealth box enclosures, a lot of them are pre-made. We hand, uh, we uh, hold them up there and, and, and stack them up. And then once they're uh, needed or once they're ordered, they'll bring them down, carpet them to the color that's uh, required, drop the subwoofer on them. It's like Rob said, it's just being efficient. We do it with subwoofers. We do it with speakers. We do it with everything um, that we do as a manufacturer. We talked about this earlier. Time is is something that you can't get, uh, can't make, right? So we want to be as efficient as possible, and by doing so, it, it just helps increase our efficiency. So that way, we're able to produce more products. There's, there's lots of things that we do in, in manufacturing that Kevin and Rob have kind of touched on, but ultimately, it comes down to some things that take longer, so it can't be done in real time. So we do it in stages, and you know, we we make it, we take advantage of what we can take advantage of. Some will refer to it as lean manufacturing, and it's certainly a part of it um, and there's a mix of conveyor style manufacturing and cell type manufacturing as you know 
and we do whatever is necessary to make sure that we build the product uh, the best way possible for not only you but also for us and our business so that's why it's different so. alonzo had a good question um uh, is the w6 water resistant for marine applications yes and no um you know on the surface there's nothing material <laughs> Uh, you know, on the cone or surround, if it got wet, they're pretty much the same materials found on the M6 and M3 products, but they don't get the um, the UV protection uh, that the marine products do, and they don't ship with stainless steel hardware. So if you're in a salty environment, uh, I would not use the included hardware just because you risk any potential rusting or anything like that. But I have seen W6s used in uh, boats. Uh, when I uh, asked on some of the groups on Facebook for installation pictures, there actually was one that was submitted of the W6s. Um, you know, just remember, these are not free air application subs like our uh, M6 and M3 IV woofers are. So you would probably want to have them in a sealed enclosure, probably tucked up, uh, you know, uh, out of the way and probably not directly exposed to the elements, but they will work but we definitely have more suitable applications with our M6 and M3 line of woofers, which you can get either uh, infinite baffle for M6 and M3 or the sealed applications if you do need an enclosure uh, with the M6 models. Can excuse my language really quick here, but we make a badass M7. Yeah, M712. <laughs> you don't need anything else. <laughs> that thing's a monster. And remember, we, we talk about our model naming or nomenclature and how we, we revere some of the numbers very highly. So when you see something that has a six in it, like, you know, a, a W6V3, that's a very important number to our company. When you see a seven, like a C7 or a W7 or what Kevin's referring to an M7, pay attention. That, that's something that, that we feel very, very uh, good about. So uh, keep that in mind. That M7 is a monster. And if you look at some of the DNA between that and uh, W6V3, I'd use that every day <laughs> without a doubt. Elias is guessing about that M7. That's just a oh, it's badass. <laughs> Without a doubt, the W7 of Marine subwoofers. I have yeah, no it's doubt. It's the number, right? M7, baby, all day long. Elias <laughs> wants to guess what year Steve started at JL Audio. I want to go one step further. What year did you start working for Jim and Lucio? I was not for the audience. That was. That's just kidding. <laughs> is, that, is this a question towards me, or is the group going to take? <laughs> well, Elias' guess is you started in 1990. Ooh, Elias has been looking at my history. So, um, I, 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 um, I lived in New York before I moved to Florida. When I moved to Florida, I wanted to get a job in audio. I loved audio, and I wanted to be a part of it. No one would hire me. They didn't have, because I had no experience. Um, so some time went by and I started applying again because I got the bug. And I remember reading in a magazine at the end of 1989, it was a car audio and electronics. So actually, uh, yeah, a car audio and electronics magazine, December of 1989, there was a vehicle that was done. It was Tommy Clark's rocket science van. And I was blown away. I had never seen anything like this ever. And I'm reading this this article about this, you know, this incredible installation. And it was done by a, a shop that was not too far from where I was living called Speaker Warehouse. And there was a guy that was in the article. His name was, it's the weirdest name I've ever heard. Strangest first name, but the most common last name, this guy, Manville Smith. And I was like, Oops, I got to find out what's going on. And so I drove down there and I applied uh, for a job and he gave me you know, a quick test. And um, I, I failed the test because I, I had no experience. So he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll call you. Never called me. So I, I tested them and harassed them time and again, waiting to get a job. Um, and six months went by. And in June of 1990, they finally shut me up and hired me at Speaker Warehouse. And that's when I started working for Jim and Lou. So the real question that Elias asked was, when did I start at JL Audio? And that's a harder question to answer. Because since JL Audio and Speaker Warehouse were very closely affiliated, the businesses were run separately. But yeah, we kind of bled over. And if JL Audio needed help, Speaker Warehouse would step in. If Speaker Warehouse needed help, so the JL Audio people would come on over. I believe my, I think my higher date in the system is 1995 that I started officially at JL Audio. But I know that I was doing trade events and things like that and going down to what was known as the warehouse uh, much more earlier than that, you know, 93. Um, 
so I don't know. To me, I, I just call it 1990s when I, you know, I met up with the JL crew, um, and I'm fortunate that I've been there ever since and never looked back. There, it's a great company to work for. Wonderful people. They took me in. They they helped educate me, and you know, hopefully, you know, I can give some of that education back. You know, people think that I know things I don't. I got really smart people around me. I just channel them. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, real quick um, to plug some upcoming trainings. I've seen a couple of questions in the chat. Um, questions about W0V3 and W1V3. Um, two comments, both separately saying uh, they get overlooked. No, they don't because they're actually going to be our next product training in two weeks. Um, our goal for this year is we're going to start rotating our trainings and going product, technical, product, technical. So the next product training will be in two weeks. And next week, we're actually going to do a um, technical training called When Good Speakers Go Bad. <laughs> you know, how your speaker can transition to the dark side of the force. <laughs> okay, maybe not to the force, but really, you know, common speaker failures. You know, what are we're going to talk about how speakers work. We're going to dispel some of these myths out there um, that uh, have just unfortunately grown and grown and grown. And we think, and I, I, I fell to some of these as well. So we'll talk about, uh, you know, how speakers really work, uh, common failures and uh, ways to avoid them. So that'll be our training next week. And then we'll have one on W1V3 and W0V3 uh, the following week. So um, looking forward to those. Yeah, me too. When Google, when Google Woofers go bad is a fun one. I think we'll have a yeah. fun one. Yeah. So. And then uh, since we've been on for two hours, I'm going to say this is our last question. But I think it's an exciting one because we can talk about, you know, our future. But again, Pierre, I was asking what the future looks like for car audio, for JL audio. Um, yes, the OEMs are coming out with nicer systems overall. And uh, but, you know, how does that affect us? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Pierre, and it's a, obviously it's one that's often talked about internally. Um, we we see a big future in, in mobile audio for sure. Um, OEM is just the latest challenge that has the, the integration is just the latest challenge that has presented itself in this arena. I kind of alluded to a moment ago that in the early days, the product uh, choices that we had in terms of subwoofers, none of it worked in vehicles because of the size constraints. We overcame that as an industry and we developed product that would work within those re uh, regions. We were talking earlier about amplifier technologies and back in the early days when the W6 first came out, large power amplifiers were very, very difficult. Uh, the electrical systems weren't strong enough or the, uh, the, the designs of the amplifiers could not fulfill the demands that we had for mobile audio. And again, the industry rose to the occasion and we came out with all different types of designs. And then Class D obviously became very prominent, allowing us to get lots of power into the electrical systems of cars and boats that uh, you know, five years prior to that, we just couldn't do. You know, things like that happen all the time. And then of course, it became the complexity of multi-driver systems where we're splitting things apart. And you know, with a passive system, it's very challenging to get those systems to sound good. Again, the industry rises up. We developed DSP technologies that allows us to, to fine tune these more complicated systems easier than ever before. Some of the early attempts at DSP were quite challenging. And the, as the aspect of integration is, is a very interesting one. Some of the earlier issues that we faced, even as, as, as early as the late 1980s, we had issues with uh, replacing a factory source unit. Um, I remember Corvettes, there was a chip built into the Corvette head unit. If you removed it, the car wouldn't start. And you know what? We got around that too. We'll continue to get around these obstacles. And there's companies like JL Audio that are very innovative in their approach to overcoming those things. There's tons of companies now that are giving us solutions. But I think part of the question was, why would we bother? I'll tell you why we bother. Some of these systems do sound very nice when you get them from the OEM until you get on the volume a little bit. When you turn up the volume, they don't have the dynamic capability that an aftermarket audio system can. They certainly will not have the low frequency capability that you get from obviously our product as a pitch for us, but anything that you're going to get in the aftermarket, you know, we put money into these subwoofers and amplifiers. We actually spend a lot of time and attention in it so that they can play to the levels that we know that you're looking for. 
the future for mobile audio is absolutely bright. JL Audio plans to be a very active part of it. We're not going anywhere in that arena for sure. Our diversity into home, power sports, and marine audio is simply a logical offshoot to help our company grow and fund the ultimate thing that drives all of us, the passion to make great audio equipment. And that's not going to change ever. We, we love mobile audio. It's where we cut our teeth and we'll stay with it. We're in, man. Absolutely. So it is a good question. And thank you for asking it. And hopefully, you know, that answers any concern that you may have had. So. All right. Well, we are well over the two hour mark. And yeah. I think Kevin's starting to do the pee pee dance in his chair. So uh, I think we call it. This was yeah, a fun I one. This was great. It, it, it went even longer than I thought, and I knew it would go long. But, you know, again, we had a lot of interest, and I, I think the questions that came in were good. Kevin put together a really good presentation and covered it really well. So thanks for that. Um, I'll let someone else edit this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a lot of questions. There was actually a good amount we weren't even able to get to today. So if we missed it, we're sorry. Please contact tech support. Uh, Carlos, Eric, Lee, they're smart dudes. They're just as passionate about all this as we are. So, you know, whether it's an enclosure question, do you go ported or sealed in this type of car? Uh, you know, reach out to them. Uh, they love this. They love what they do. They love designing enclosures. They love helping our customers and our dealers, you know, really get the best performance from their system. So if we missed your question, we're sorry, <laughs> but, uh, you know, reach out to our tech support team because uh, they probably would give you better answers than we would anyways. <laughs> Cool. Well, our usual plug, let us know what you want to hear from us and when you want to hear it. Uh, these Thursday at 4 o'clock Eastern time is what seems to be working well. And our uh, pattern that Rob just said is kind of our plan. If there's something you feel really passionate about in terms of uh, a topic or um, a change in you know the, the time, let us know. We're here for you. And on that note, I'm going to say good night to everyone. And uh, thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. Then. Thanks, guys. Have a good night, everybody.